Well, happy Monday. Here we are. It's a new week. We're uh, as excited as ever to be uh, broadcasting from our undisclosed locations across the United States. And uh, hopefully everybody had a great weekend and a uh, uh, enjoyable time. Thankfully here uh, in the Chicago area, the sun is out today. I got to see out the window, stepped out this morning. I'm like, oh, look at that. It's not snowing. Isn't that nice? I'm sure New York is kind of very similar. And uh, coming from uh, beautiful Ohio with us today is Steve Savanu. And um, we'll a uh, little more shout out to the Midwest region today. So it's two to two. We got uh, the Midwest and the East Coast. We're ready to do battle and, uh, and everything. So hopefully everybody's um, kind of settling into these new norms, right? And, uh, you know, in the news, we saw a lot of, uh, okay, school this, school that, you know, we're, 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 we're done or whatever it is. And I think, you know, like all of us, we're kind of like, yeah, we're done, but here we are. And we're going to be here just a little while longer and we're making the best use of our time. Uh, while my, uh, my children's school may be uh, wrapping up sooner than later, our school is still open. And uh, the good news is our tuition is pretty low right now. Um, we are extending our deal um, at least a couple more weeks, tuition free. Right. I mean, I had to fight Pete and Mac tooth and nail to, 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 to not charge more. Um, uh, but uh, anyhow, today's topic, you know, when I'll be in the in the total dis. Uh, 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 I will give my disclaimer up front. When Pete first talked to me about this topic, I was like, microphones. Everybody knows about microphones. Right. And we started talking more and then uh uh, we were, as as we discussed it, it was like, all right, well, let's, but like in the true um, um, intent of practical show tech is to say, yeah, here's the basics. Now let's take it a little deeper, right? And that's kind of what we're doing today with, with a technology that we all think about as just, it's just there. It's a microphone, right? Makes my voice louder, makes whatever instrument I'm miking, right? So. Uh, today, like I introduced already, we got Steve with us. Uh, Steve has been uh, running the educational um, program for AT Audio Technica for uh, quite a few years. Um, in addition to that, Steve is um, a, a teacher in a lot of different um, uh, different venues. Um, he uh, has has been an adjunct um, uh, teacher over at Kent State, adjunct professor there. But he's also um, speaks regularly at a number of of training schools for recording and a uh, live audio. So um, uh, to say that Steve has honed his craft of of teaching, I think it might might be a little understatement. But uh, this is something that Steve has an extreme passion for, and I think that we would all agree that's something we have a passion for. Well, as well, which is sharing knowledge um sharing information and um so that's what today is about um you know it, it's uh obviously steve does represent at but you i think you'll see in the handouts that yes are in the uh the handout section you're gonna see that this is about um not just a brand but this is about knowledge this is about um how uh, the the role that this device plays in everything we do. So um, uh, enough of me talking. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Pete and Mac to uh, talk about the the Q and A. Anybody that's joining us uh, for the first time, or even if uh, you've been with us for every episode, um, they're going to help you re just remember a few things. So uh, Pete, Mac, go ahead. Well, to those of you who have not been here before, uh, we have uh, in, in your control panel, your GoToWebinar control panel, which in my case is on the left side of the screen. I, I think a lot of you will find it on the right side of the screen. Uh, there's a little pull down, uh, a pull down tab on, on that list of, uh, I guess, functions called questions. Uh, if you open that, you can type your question in there. Um, not everyone will see the questions. Uh, we will be curating the questions and um, 
putting them into a format so people with old eyes like us can can read them in bigger type because this is a kind of small type in those questions. Uh, but but by all means, put in your questions uh, as soon as you have them. They may not be answered at that moment, so they may be out of time. Uh, if you're following along in the handout, which will be uh, Steve's a copy of Steve's PowerPoint as a, as a PDF, you can take notes in there. Uh, so. Well, actually, they won't help us. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, but uh, uh, by all means, ask your questions. And we will try to get to all of them. It's unlikely we will get to all of them, but but we will try to cover the topic of every question uh, that's asked. Um, Pete? 144 years ago, Emil Berliner, along with Thomas Edison, <laughs> And we've got to do something about these webinars we're doing because nobody can hear us. So they came up with these things. Here, that thing. So exactly, exactly. And Steve, a cousin of Emil Berliner, is going to tell us all about it. Go ahead, Steve. All right, I'm going to hit the show button here and everybody should see my little PowerPoint thing. Thank you guys for having me do this. I mean, I've been coming to a lot of these and I've learned an awful lot about networks and comms and all of that kind of stuff. But everything we kind of run into in our life, I think, uses a microphone. And we all have at least one microphone probably in our hand right now if you've got your cell phone in your hand. I'm Steve Savanio. I am the Director of Educational Services at Audio-Technica. I've got 40 years of experience in the audio industry with Studio Live. Uh, live sound, audio for video, broadcast. I'm a working, gigging sound guy. I own a sound company as well, and I use microphones a lot. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit of background about me. I am passionate about my craft and uh, enjoy it thoroughly. Um, brief look back. This is microphones in the good old days, and I'm an avid microphone collector. You might see a few of them on the shelf behind me. Uh, RCA 44B, which is sitting back here on the table, works. The RCA 77, I have to repair because it's got a broken cable. But this is the way microphones used to be. And truthfully, I have no idea what that statue is on the uh, table in front of Young Bing there. Thankfully, today, technology has improved. But it's interesting, in this world of audio and technology, microphones are one of the few things that still hold their value. Uh, I did a little research about a month and a half ago before I did this uh, this workshop at uh, Crass, and I looked up a few microphones on eBay and the RCA 44B that's sitting back on the table right now, about 3,800 bucks on eBay, the RCA 77B 2395, and I own 10 Neumann KM84s, $1,799 a piece on eBay, compared to the Midas Heritage 3000 analog 56 channel console, which is going for $4,700, but you have to pick it up. And the adapt machine, we all remember those, right? $49 on eBay, I think it said parts only. And of course, how many of those old IBM XT computers are tossed in the dumpster? So think about that technology. Microphones still hold their value, which is why a lot of people collect them. Sylvia Massey just uh, acquired the uh, the huge microphone, Bob Paquette Microphone Museum collection, and is curating a museum, uh, which is an amazing microphone collection. So microphones still hold their value. So a couple of rules that I'd like to talk about before I get into this, and we'll do a little quick review of some fundamentals of sound as well. First thing I'd like to talk about is signal to noise. And we all know what signal noise ratios are. We see them in specs all the time. In this case, I say signal's the desired sound source, and noise is everything else. And it's expressed in a ratio. The better that ratio is, the better the signal to noise ratio we have, the better the performance is going to be on that microphone. And of course, when I do this thing live, I, have a, I, have, I request a fairly large PA system and a mixer at the table where I can do some demonstrations. Obviously, I can't do it here, but one of the things I do is I demonstrate acoustical feedback, kind of, sort of. And we all know what it is. We always hear it. And I always get a big kick out of I see somebody on TV and they walk up to a microphone. The first thing they do is they tap it. The second thing happens is it squeals slightly and then they go testing one, two, or they start talking. So acoustical feedback, we all know what it is, but why does it occur? 
And it basically occurs when the sound pressure level of the amplified stuff in the room, the noise the microphone picks up, is equal to or greater than that of the original sound source. And of course, I always ask the question, and I can't do it here, but I will anyway, what are the two best microphones in the world? And usually somebody will yell out SM58 or a Telefunk and something or a U47. And actually the two best microphones in the world are your ears, your left one and your right one. The reason why is they're the only two microphones that can discriminate sound. And what do I mean by discriminate sound? So I'm standing uh, out in front of my house watching people walk by keeping their social distance. And I'm talking to the neighbor who's explaining to me about how he's going to cut his grass this summer. And he's going into great detail on that. And uh, uh, as he's doing all that, he's uh, just telling me about the fertilizer and the blah, 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 blah. In the meantime, two people kind of across the street are talking in loud voices about the latest Kardashian scandal. Well, I can tune out Mr. Blah, blah, blah and tune in the Kardashian scandal. Uh, Kardashian thing with uh, my ears, but trying to do that with any of the microphones I have and recording that, I'm just going to get a bunch of noise. So take good care of those ears because they are the um, uh, they're the two best microphones in the world. First question came in. I have to touch this question. I'll take care of it right out of the chute. The question is, what are the standards for sanitizing mics going forward in this new world of COVID-19? Uh, Audio-Technica, like other manufacturers, has put some basic cleaning protocols on our website. The big issue is, is we don't know how to sanitize right now to take care of uh, COVID-19 and other viruses. We can tell you how to protect a microphone. We can tell you how to do some basic cleaning, but nobody knows. I've heard people talk about the ultraviolet and things of that nature. Uh, we've also talked about maybe disposable windscreens or covers for microphones that don't affect the sound that'll be used. Uh, as a sound company, um, I do some preventative maintenance cleaning on my vocal microphones in my mic inventory, but we don't have a standard um, right now on that. We have some protocol for cleaning headphones and microphones on our website. There's others that have put them out. Uh, and, but we don't. Uh, we have to put that big disclaimer in. These are just normal cleaning processes. They don't necessarily uh, remove or get rid of or eliminate any kind of viruses. Uh, but you can find that it's under the support section on our website. It's called care and cleaning of your headphones and microphones. So hopefully, um, you know, people talk about spraying stuff like bleach and alcohol into their microphones. The problem that you're running into is if things get on the diaphragm that could affect the performance of the microphone or damage the diaphragm. So you do need to be careful. The good thing about most handheld vocal microphones is you can remove the head case. And the head case is something that could be cleaned. Uh, there's some foams out there that people have used. There's also a little foam insert in the bottom. I can't pull it out with my fingertips. So tweezers will get that out and that could be washed. These can be scrubbed fairly well. I would do that normally even without virus issues, just because I've seen many a microphone head case where there's gobs of makeup and lipstick and stuff on it. Uh, and just basic good microphone, you know, practices, wiping the handle down with uh, uh, some sort of a, a, a soap-based cleaner or alcohol-based cleaner provided at 70% or greater. But we don't have a we can't say, and we have a disclaimer on our cleaning protocol, that it will not. Um, we can't say that it will take care of viruses or things like that. So, um, but I've heard people say, well, spray bleach into it and all that kind of stuff. And I, we just say, we, you can't necessarily do that. A microphone's a precision device, and it's got some precision technology in it, especially if you're getting into side address studio mics and things like that. Putting a pop filter in front of this is going to help keep a lot of that junk from getting on that microphone in general. But uh, we don't. We have a basic cleaning protocol. The other thing I recommend is if you're dealing with a vocalist or you are a vocalist, get your own microphone. If you don't believe me, go to our YouTube channel and Google search "get your own mic" and watch the video. But don't do it before or after a meal, if you know what I mean. So hopefully that answered the question. Uh, and it's it's something we're doing more and more research on. And as we get more research, we will post uh, cleaning protocols and, and that type of thing to our website is the best place to find that information out. And go with a trusted manufacturer like one of the big manufacturers as opposed to some guy on YouTube that says, hey, here's how to clean your microphone. And he dunks it into a, into a tub of bleach or something. So anyway, I'll move on.
So recording versus live sound. Recording always says creativity, experimentation, new techniques, and pushing that envelope. I like to call live sound damage control, preventing problems before they can happen. And get that vocal channel, that money channel up first. Worry about getting that great snare drum sound later on as you put that mix together. Just a real quick review. I know we are all seasoned professionals watching this webinar, but there might be a few that uh, this is their first time of getting involved in audio. Might be lighting guys trying to learn about audio. Might be uh, uh, video guys trying to learn about audio. Um, let's see, free field. I'm reading the questions as they pop in. I have the questions coming up on a little screen beside me. So if I do this, it means I'm getting the magnifying glass out and uh, trying to, to learn that, to read the questions. A little bit about the real quick review, some sound wave things. So again, we're talking about a three-dimensional thing I'm showing on a two-dimensional uh, PowerPoint slide. I tried to send everybody 3D glasses, but I couldn't get them out quick enough. So we take a look at a sound wave, and it's a three-dimensional thing. It looks more like that spring as it comes out. It is pressure in a medium. In most cases, the medium is air. The velocity is how fast it travels in that medium, and, and, and the, in this case, it's air. Our frequency is how fast it occurs. Uh, amplitude is how loud it is. The wavelength is the length of that wave. Obviously, higher frequency waves are going to be smaller. Lower frequency waves are going to be larger. And of course, phase. Phase is how two waves uh, interact between each other. When waves are in phase or going together like this, they add together. It's like the racing roller coasters at Kings Island when the blue train gets to the top of the hill and the red train's at the bottom of the hill. Those waves are out of phase and they will cancel each other out. So knowing that information, of course, it's all physics. This is, the, this is not just a rule, it's the law in some cases. We know that high frequencies behave a lot like a spotlight and low frequencies behave a lot like a bare light bulb. They're more omnidirectional versus the high frequencies are more directional. So the scenario is I'm standing out on the, the corner of downtown Hudson and I hear the guy coming into town with the most you know, kick butt car stereo known to mankind. And what do I hear first? I hear the bass first. Because the big bass frequency waves are omnidirectional, they pretty much go in all directions. And I don't really realize the guy's listening to heavy metal polkas until he gets right up behind me at the stoplight and I can actually hear what he's listening to. So high frequencies behave like a spotlight, low frequencies behave like a bare light bulb. Now we can represent the frequency response of a device using a graph. It's a graphical representation of how this device reproduces the relative amplitudes of all frequencies presented to its input. Wider is better. Flatter is typically better. However, a lot of microphones have what we call a tailored response. For example, I have a, I actually purchased it at a flea market for a dollar, a B&K Precision Lab measurement microphone, which I found out was worth about seven grand. It is flat as, flat as a board from zero to light flat as a board. I thought, wow, this is going to be an amazing microphone. So I tried to record an acoustic guitar with it. And because it had no tailoring, it had no coloration, it sounded pretty sterile. It sounded pretty sterile. But for a measurement microphone, it was spot on. So the cool thing about microphone manufacturers is that whether it's us or Shure or Sennheiser or AKG or any of the majors, Neumann, we all pretty much use the same standards and we share our measurement standards information with each other. So when you're comparing microphones, you can literally compare us to a Shure microphone um, and we're all going to be measuring the same thing as say compared to like power amplifier guys and that are measuring power amplifiers like 50,000 watts of instantaneous peak power, which is like the snap when you turn the power on. So it's a graphical representation. Wider is better. Flatter is better. But most microphones have a tailored response. If you take a look at this one, there's two things you can notice. One is it's got a slight rise at the top end above 5K. And second, the dotted line shows that it rolls off the low frequencies at about uh, starting about 200 hertz, um, which is going to eliminate mechanical noise coming up through the mic cable on that microphone. <clears throat> Interesting thing is the human voice. Our voice range is approximately 100 hertz to about 6K, which is why telephones were designed for that mid-range presence. 80% of that voice energy is used to go below 500 hertz. So when I get down deep and low, I'm using more of my voice energy to get those low notes than say a little kid that's screaming. Um, the presence range is between about 2K and 5K and that's what maintains intelligibility. It's key for dialogue. 
and when you're in the presence range, the voice sounds near to you. And a lot of microphones have put into their frequency response curve something known as the presence peak. Uh, the most, uh, probably the most well-known presence peak in a microphone is the Shure SM58. There's a slight uh, rise at a little, about 2,500, followed by a slight dip, and then the microphone rises again till the end of its response where it naturally rolls off uh, because it's a dynamic. And that frequency response curve or that presence peak was designed because the original PA systems back in the day were things like uh, sound columns, you know, eight six inch speakers or six eight inch speakers and the pa systems couldn't really reproduce that mid-range very well so the microphone manufacturers tailored the microphone response to make the sound systems more efficient in the mid-range people like the way that sounds and although today i can adjust eq on my mixer to accommodate that i don't necessarily need that presence peak people like that tailoring of sound in our studio mic line, we have seven microphones that look almost identical. There's a couple that are different colors that are a couple that are a little bit larger maybe uh, because they're uh, of the electronics in them. Interesting thing is about those is they all have slightly different colorations. They have slightly different timbre in their microphone sounds. So every manufacturer is going to tailor that microphone for a specific application. So not all microphones sound the same. I like to say microphones are like the paint chips in a Sherwin-Williams store. You want blue, what shade of blue do you want? Do you want the light blue? Do you want sky blue? Do you want deep blue? Do you want navy blue? Do you want indigo? So microphones are like the paint chips in a, in a paint store. So now we've talked about a little background on fundamentals of sound. Let's talk about microphones. We'll talk about the types of microphones. We'll talk about diaphragms. We'll talk about angles. We'll talk about uh, mics and monitor options and live sound. We'll talk about the inverse square law. And even though I'm in the microphone business, more is not always better. So first of all, microphones are transducers. They convert one form of energy to another. A loudspeaker converts electrical energy into mechanical energy into acoustical energy. Microphones, on the, other, on the other hand, convert acoustical energy into mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the question I always ask my students are, can I use a loudspeaker as a microphone? Absolutely, right? You drive up to the fast food drive through and the girl says, would you like fries with that? And when you say, yes, I'll have my fries well done, more often than not, when you're talking back to the person taking your order in that drive through you are using the microphone or you know, the loudspeaker that they talk to you on as the microphone that you're talking back to them on. Can a microphone be used as a loudspeaker? In some cases, yes, but I wouldn't want to do it. In fact, when I was a kid, I got my first little tape recorder and I accidentally plugged the microphone into the earphone jack by mistake. And wow, I could hear sound coming out of my little microphone. I got all my friends together, said, check this out, turned it up, and unfortunately, I had to go buy a new microphone. So yes. So here's a good example of a loudspeaker being used as a microphone. This is a woofer from an old NS10 studio monitor, mounted in an extremely heavy duty mic stand, set in front of a kick drum. I have another microphone inside the kick drum. The idea is I'm gonna get the subharmonics coming off of the kick drum. And Yamaha actually took that concept and they made a product called the Sub Kick, which is the NS10 woofers inside a little drum head looking thing, which looks much cooler than what I had in my situation. So in a nutshell, let's talk about the three main microphone types that we use in recording and also in live sound. There are some others out there, uh, which I'll touch on for just a moment, uh, but the three main types we talk about are dynamic, condensers, and ribbons. The other two that you might run into, if you're a harmonica player, you might run into a crystal or ceramic microphone. And if you've got some relative that lives out in no man's land and still using one of those big old Western electric telephones with the, uh, uh, the handle that you hold up like this as opposed to a cell phone. More often than not, that uh, microphone in that telephone handset is a carbon microphone. So when you're talking to grandma and the phone's all crackly and kind of staticky sounding, just have grandma pound that uh, handset on the table a few times to loosen those carbon granules and it'll make that static crackly sound go away. So back to real life in live sound and studio work, we typically use dynamic condenser and ribbon microphones. Dynamic microphones will typically handle an unlimited amount of SPLs or sound pressure level. They don't require any power to operate. They can take a lot of abuse. I take this dynamic microphone and I usually pound on the table with it at the seminar, but I won't do it here in front of you guys. 
unfortunately, dynamic microphones can be very difficult to miniaturize. So if you see any photos of newscasters doing uh, like election results from like the 1950s, early 60s, they're wearing a big dynamic microphone on a lanyard around their neck because that was the smallest they could get away with. They did do some lavalier microphones dynamic wise, and they were a little bit larger than my thumb and still pretty difficult to miniaturize. Condenser microphones, on the other hand, have a much hotter output, much wider frequency response, and we'll tell you the reason why in a moment. They do require some sort of power to operate, and that power does two things, which we'll talk about in a moment, and they can be made very tiny, and you've seen the little ear set microphones that are worn by presenters and church pastors and some vocalists, and you're almost invisible, and a lot of the lavalier microphones are almost invisible. And last but not least is the ribbon microphone, and ribbon microphones were at one time the broadcast standard because they had a smooth top end and a really rich low end which gave all of those newscasters and presenters that big deep am radio voice uh unfortunately the old ribbon microphones were quite fragile new microphone new ribbons are much more rugged they will handle a fairly high spl and they were the traditional big studio mic <clears throat> As my little guy down in the right-hand corner, Mr. Fish says, choose condensers for most recording applications, dynamics for high SPL sound sources, and ribbons to tame that harsh digital edge. And I'll get into that in just a moment. <laughs> so if we take a look at the dynamic microphone, the dynamic microphone is basically a loudspeaker in reverse. It is based on magnetic induction using a moving coil. So we've got a, a diaphragm attached to a paper core wrapped with wire that moves back and forth over a magnet and seventh grade science says if i move a coil of wire over a magnet i get and the entire class shouts out electricity so the uh, it is a motor it is a motor generates that voltage because of the physics involved in making this motor both magnet structure and the coil of wire and so on it's difficult to miniaturize this it doesn't require any power to operate and it is extremely rugged. If it's a well-built dynamic microphone, there were some EV mics that broadcasters used back in the 60s that they called the Buchanan Hammer. The Buchanan Hammer is actually one of them on the shelf behind me, and the ad actually showed a guy pounding a nail with that microphone. Because it's difficult to miniaturize that motor assembly, you don't see too many dynamic lavalier mics today. Uh, and the other issue is there are some frequency response limitations just caused by the mechanics of the motor. It takes quite a bit of, of energy to move that uh, diaphragm assembly and so on. And I just lost my question thing. Let me turn it back on. Okay, no new questions. But dynamic microphones are extremely rugged, and they are probably the go-to standard in pretty much most of the live sound applications and a lot of the broadcast applications. Condenser microphones. They work on a variable capacitance principle, an electrostatic principle. In fact, across the pond, they are called capacitor microphones. Here we call them condenser microphones because capacitor and condenser are interchangeable terms. So basically what we have is an electrically charged backplate and an electrically charged diaphragm, a piece of mylar that is sputtered with a thin coating of some uh, precious metal, typically gold. It is suspended in front of this electrically charged backplane, insulating, insulated with a spacer ring. As the diaphragm moves, the distance between the diaphragm and the uh, backplane changes, which changes the capacitance, which generates a very tiny voltage. That voltage is very small and needs to be amplified. Thus, condenser microphones have some sort of amplification in them to boost that signal is something that's usable, which is why condenser microphones, one reason why they require power. That is known as the integral FET amplifier. It boosts that signal to a usable level. It has to be close to the capsule because it's a very high impedance circuit. So if you're dealing with a condenser microphone with interchangeable capsules, there's a lot of pencil condenser mics that we make and others make, where you can change the capsule to change the polar pattern. When you pull that capsule off, there's a little brass tip or maybe a gold-plated tip. That tip is the input to that little FET amplifier. If you live in a place like I do in Ohio, it gets kind of cold and dry in the wintertime. So if you're shuffling across the carpeted stage and you go to change your capsules and you actually touch that, uh, that little brass tip with your finger and you zap it with static electricity, there's a good chance you could destroy that FET amplifier. So you do need to be a little bit careful because they are sensitive to static electricity. 
They require a voltage to operate. That voltage can come up the microphone cable as phantom power or phantom voltage. It might come from an external power supply in some cases. Uh, if, it's a, uh, if it's a tube microphone, or it could come from a battery which supplies that bias voltage to drive that amplifier. Because there's an amplifier in there, condenser microphones have a max SPL uh, handling capability. It's not the diaphragm bottoming, bottoming out against the back plane, it's overloading the front end of that amplifier. The same way if I crank the input up to my preamp on my rig here, I would overload the input to the preamp and distort. Sometimes condenser microphones will have a 10D switchable pad that allows the microphone to handle higher SPL by lowering the input level to the preamp. So electro, elect, externally biased or electret. Originally, true condenser microphones used an externally biased backplane where it got its uh, polarizing voltage from an external power support, maybe, maybe phantom power or some type of power supply. The uh, microphone had circuitry in it called a voltage doubler that converted that, uh, um, that phantom power to some higher voltage to polarize that backplate. A lot of guys will call that a true condenser. People would say, well, Electrets used a permanently charged backplate that's permanently charged by the manufacturer when the microphone is built. And originally, Electret condensers were considered inferior. The low-cost condenser microphones used that uh, permanently charged backplate. We have found that the technology on permanently charged backplates has improved considerably over the years. And this uh, uh, Audio-Technica 5040 a uh, studio condenser microphone, which is our boutique product, has a permanently charged condenser backplate. One nice thing about uh, Electret microphones is they can be powered by an internal battery. And a lot of the original, the home consumer condenser microphones were powered by a battery. We make some battery powered condenser microphones, both shotgun style and uh, stereo uh, single point microphones that are used by broadcasters in stadium audience pickup situations where they, they're trying to push phantom down a long cable using the uh, outside plant of a stadium. And typically in the outside plant wiring, and it's been there for a while, the shield connections start to go. Um, and by putting a battery powered microphone for the visitor side, uh, crowd mics, if there are issues with the shields and phantom power getting to that microphone, the battery kicks in and still allows the microphone to operate. Uh, most uh, real small condenser microphone capsules, the little head-worn mics and some of the tiny lavaliers are Electret microphones. So Electrets and externally biased at one time, yeah, people were saying, well, if it's not a true condenser, it's not a true condenser. But now we're seeing that myth being busted. Solid state or vacuum tube. Originally condenser microphones used a vacuum tube to supply the amplifier stage. Um, vacuum tubes required a high voltage power supply and a special cable between that power supply and the microphone. They also required some warm up time to let the tube stabilize, and typically we recommend 30 minutes on our tube powered condenser microphones. Some people will say that a tube condenser microphone has a warmer sound just because people say tubes have warmer sounds. And some vintage tube microphones can be quite pricey, especially some of the old Telefunkens and some of the old Neumann uh, tube condenser microphones. We make a 4060 tube microphone. It's got the warmth of a tube. It's also got the ruggedness of some of our other condenser microphones. And we see that used on a lot of live tours as well as in the studio. Solid state condenser microphones, on the other hand, uh, use a solid state transistor amplifier stage. Some people think they have a brighter sound because the solid state uh, transistors are a little bit brighter than their tube counterparts. They're typically less expensive and they can be powered by uh, uh, battery or phantom power. The other thing is a solid state microphone typically has a standard XLR type output connector. Interestingly enough, Audio-Technica a few years back built a uh, tube, phantom powered tube condenser microphone using some vintage hearing aid tubes. And when we ran out of the new old stock of tubes, we had to discontinue the product. There are still a few of those laying around. I think one other microphone company still makes a uh, uh, tube style uh, phantom powered condenser microphone. Um, can you comment on why some condensers use RF charged backplates? Uh, the only one I know of is a permanently charged backplate, so I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to do some research on that. I will try and do that research and and uh, and get back to everybody uh, post uh, seminar session. Um, I'll get to Omni mics. Oh, sorry. 
free field, diffuse field, pressure field. Okay, we'll talk about pressure in a minute when we get into uh, into uh, microphones, into uh, 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 into the into the capsules a little bit more. So let's talk about ribbon microphones and why have ribbon microphones all of a sudden become really popular? So ribbon microphone, it's the the purest form of transdu transducer out there. A corrugated ribbon is suspended between the poles of a large permanent magnet. Air hitting the ribbon causes it to move. Movement of the ribbon in that magnetic uh, force line breaks those magnetic force lines, inducing a very small voltage. And the step-up transformer boosts that voltage to something usable. Now, the original ribbon microphones were designed to drive a 600-ohm input circuit on a passive Western Electric-style mixing board or mixing unit in the broadcast world. Ribbon microphones were used by radio stations and TV stations um, a while back, and they were the go-to microphones for, um, uh, for these applications. One of the big problems with ribbon microphones is they were extremely fragile. You had to store them vertically. If you laid them on their sides, the ribbon would sag and deform. If some moron walked up to your ribbon microphone and blew into it, to see if it was working. Usually after they blew into it, the engineer cried because the microphone was no longer working because that big puff of air literally blew the ribbon out. And that ribbon is very, very thin. Imagine peeling the foil off a Wrigley's Spearmint Gum wrapper, Kelly, Wrigley's Spearmint Gum wrapper, and making a small accordion out of that piece of foil. That's about how thin the ribbon is. Some of the newer models have done things to protect the ribbon. Uh, we have 16 patents on our uh, two ribbon microphones on how the ribbon was made. We micro imprint the foil as well to give it a little bit more rigidity. Uh, and most of the new ribbon microphones uh, have active electro, a lot of the new ribbon microphones have active electronics in them uh, to provide some a more up-to-date impedance matching. So a little history on ribbon microphones and why they became popular. Back in the day when I went to school, and I'm dating myself here, we recorded on analog reel-to-reel. -reel. And we were taught to record bright, pound the meters, and record, or bright, go for uh, extended high frequency range, and hot, pound the meters. So we used condenser microphones with our extended high range response, and we basically hit the input level as hot as we could get away with. And um, the uh, record hot and bright because every time we did a bounce down or a dub down, we had a generation loss. So by the time you got down to your final mix after several generation losses, the high end was pretty much tamed, or we could always roll a little bit off with some passive EQ. Fast forward to the digital domain, and when you do a bounce down, this is actually a question on my midterm. Uh, when you do a bounce down in the digital digital domain, Nothing happens. Everything stays the same. And I tell the kids, if you leave that question right on my midterm, you will leave it blank. You will get it correct because nothing happens. So guys who were taught the way I was taught to record, record hot, record bright, our recordings, digital recordings, sounded brash and brittle sounding. So guys rediscovered these ribbon microphones that were kind of languishing back in the back of the microphone cabinet or the dumpster in some cases, and found they had that a smoother top end, not as extended as a condenser, and they still had the rich warmth. And they brought the ribbon microphone back, bringing back these vintage ones like the 77 and the 44B. The impedance for those microphones was really designed to work into a 600 ohm transformer coupled um, mixer circuit. All of a sudden, they're trying to put those microphones into modern uh, op-amp style preamps and, and uh, mixer inputs, and they were getting really bad impedance mismatches, so the input levels were quite low, and so the noise floor went up. So companies like Cloud came out with the Cloud Lift device, which is basically an impedance converter to help match these vintage ribbon microphones to modern day circuits. What we did and what uh, other people like Royer have done in their active ribbon microphones is provided impedance matching circuits to make these microphones look more like a condenser microphone to the uh, modern day input circuits. Um, if you're using some of the vintage mics like my RCAs down there, you're probably gonna have to have some sort of an impedance converter like a cloud lifter to really get the level up to where you want it to be with a modern mixer or input circuit. Um, let's see, I'll, a couple of questions here. What features of the Neumann U87 make it such a pricey preferred vocal microphone? You know, that gets back into personal preference. The U87 was designed and has just 
a, a sound that people like, the same way a lot of live vocalists like the sound of an SM58. Um, there are vintage mics. Vintage mics will hold their value. Um, there are two microphone. Uh, um, so I think the it's just the personal preference on that. And again, microphones are like paint chips. It's what do people like the sound of is the, probably the best way I can answer that. Um, the uh, It's just a great sounding microphone in general. Um, let's see, Suncouch is MKH, the exclusive MKH series, Rode is new Simba design. Some of it's caused a change in capacity inside the capsule, call it RF capacitor, eight kilohertz, same way. You call it a simple FM radio station. I'm not, I'll have to dig into that a little bit more. I'm not real familiar with that technology. Um, so I, I, I have to kind of play, I, I need to dig into that more. I can't give a real good answer on that question. Steve, um, it's, but, uh, Go ahead, Pete. That's just that's just a definition I got off of Sennheiser's we website. So this okay. is their description of what their technology is in the MKH. Okay, so I again I'll have to um, the, dig into the, that. The main difference is is that those kind of electric mics work as an oscillator. This the, the capacitor is is a part of the oscillator, which as it changes the frequency the frequency of the oscillation creates electric uh, electrical signal on the output as opposed to going to a fed amplifier like more of the traditional exactly. condenser mics exactly okay so sorry, sorry doing an awesome as pete says they're doing more of an oscillator technique as opposed to the traditional fet amplifier that uh um that most of the condenser microphones out there use um so i everybody learns so it's interesting education is a really amazing thing and i'll diverge for just a second I learned from a gentleman, uh, Synod Con. Uh, I learned from the original Don Davis back in the 70s when I took my first Synod Con class. And Don Davis had a saying, and I like to use his saying, and Don Davis's saying was, I was walking down the street and I had a dollar. And I met a man and he had the, another dollar. We both exchanged dollars. And we both walked away with a dollar. I was walking down the street and I had an idea and I met a man and he had an idea. And we both exchanged ideas and we both walked away with two ideas. So even though I've been in the microphone business for a number of years, we still learn new things every day as new technologies come out there and new things are happening. So it's all about learning. And I'm glad to be here doing that learning part of this. So hopefully, hopefully I am teaching as well as you guys are learning. Um, yes, in these days, condenser microphones can be affected by high, high humidities. And the classic sound of a condenser microphone being affected by humidity, I'm thinking a condenser mic used in a live vocal situation on a live stage or a rainy day, is what will happen is this moisture will get on that insulating spacer and literally start to short out between the two, um, between the, the back plane and the diaphragm. And you'll get a sound that sounds a little bit like bacon frying. If that happens, the best thing to do is take the condenser microphone and put it in a Tupperware tub with rice in it to just let it work, let the rice work as a moisture absorbent. Um, so yes, in the in the live sound situation, especially if you're in a really humid environment, a rainy environment, uh, and even if moisture gets on the microphone, there is a possibility it can affect the performance. Um, it will affect, um, you'll get a bacon frying type sound in the background of, of that audio. And the best thing to do is just put the microphone in a Tupperware tub and with, uh, with rice in it, it'll work as a de uh, like a decessant, uh, like one of those little things that you tell your kids not to eat. Let's talk about real quick transit response. So I brought in the world renowned Mr. Fish to play the triangle because he plays the tri triangle in the Philharmonic. And I set a condenser microphone up next to him and a dynamic microphone. Because of the designs of the microphone and the physics involved, a condenser microphone is going to react quickly and stop quickly, kind of like a Ferrari out on the freeway. The dynamic microphone, on the other hand, is going to react slowly, and it's going to continue to oscillate as that diaphragm, that motor effect, kind of decays away. So I took a scope picture of both of those, and the condenser reacts quick, 0 to 60 in 10 seconds, stops on a dime. The dynamic microphone is like one of those big old double-decker London buses, right? It takes a couple seconds to get up to speed, and if somebody runs out in front of it, it's going to take a while to stop, which is why when I'm out at a club and I see a bunch of dynamic handheld microphones being used for things like drum overheads, I know that either the lighting guy is doing sound tonight or the barmaid is doing sound tonight, and they have, or the band got a great deal on these mics, you know, like buy 10, get six free over at the local big box music emporium. 
So transient response, how a microphone reacts to short nuance, audio nuances. Diaphragm size, big or small. Large diaphragms, typically a manufacturer says a large diaphragm microphone, the diaphragm is an inch or larger. Small diaphragms are under an inch. Classic studio vocal, classic live sound vocal is going to give you a big, rich vocal sound. A lot of people will say a larger diaphragm is going to give you a little bit more low end, a little bit warmer, a little bit more natural sound. And the thicker, larger diaphragms are going to be more durable and they're going to handle higher SPLs. Large diaphragm microphones are typically available in single or multi pattern configurations, selectable by a switch. Um, typically, more natural, more warmer sound. Small diaphragm microphones, on the other hand, are going to handle those transients quicker, better transient response. A lot of folks will say they'll sound brighter with a lot more detail in the sound because of the small diaphragm, more articulation in the small diaphragm, which is why you'll see small diaphragm mics used in shotgun mics for dialogue recording and uh, things of that nature. Good choice for woodwind strings, acoustical instruments, or other delicate things where there's a lot of detail that needs to be captured. Interestingly enough, I show a large diaphragm vocal uh, voiceover broadcast style microphone. I show a large diaphragm studio condenser, which is actually this guy right here. The small diaphragm mics, the first one's a side address small diaphragm microphone, and the second is the classic pencil microphone. The one on the right, which is this 5040, which I'm using for my voice today, is a kind of the best of both worlds. There are four capsules in that microphone. The four capsules uh, are small diaphragm capsules and the circuitry in the microphone combines them together to work as a large diaphragm. So we get the transient response on that mic as well as the richness of a large diaphragm condenser. The downside is the 5040 uh, 5040 microphone is an extremely hot output because all four capsules are summed through four separate amplifiers and then they go to a summing circuit so it will overdrive a lot of mic pre's if you put a real large SPL uh, sound source on it. Um, let's see, um, is the difference in transit response all due to mass difference or are there other factors magnetic currents? Um, Typically, it's a small diaphragm. It's the size of the diaphragm. It's the thinness of the diaphragm. Um, the more magnet structure in the, uh, and, and we're condensers we're talking in this case, so there's no magnet structure in the condenser mics and the small and large diaphragms. In the large diaphragm microphone, the more dense the magnet structure is, if you're getting into neodymium style magnets, you're going to get a hotter output on those microphones. But typically the magnet structure is in a dynamic and it's going to be a larger diaphragm microphone. The magnetic structure, depending on the type of material used for the magnet, is going to give you a hotter output. So we have um, a lot of our neodymium microphones, we used to have high energy written on the microphone because it was um, the neodymium magnet material is going to give you a hotter output, a more efficient performance than other magnetic materials. Same way in, in loudspeaker diaphragms. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the U67s, the tube mic, the U87 is a solid state mic. Correct. Uh, thank you, Bernie, on that. Uh, I don't know all the Neumann model numbers. I know a few of them. Uh, but yes, it, the U87 is not. The U87 is just the way the microphone was built. It's just people like the sound of it. It's a personal preference more than in a lot of cases. Pick up pattern and directionality. So we talked about how microphones generate sound. Let's talk about how they pick up sound. And pick up pattern or directionality is how a microphone responds to sound arriving from different directions. Omnidirectional favors all directions equally. Directional favors a specific direction, the favored direction being on axis and other directions being off axis. It's interesting that all microphones are born omnidirectional and microphone manufacturers put in these ports, and you can see these little side things around here, and they engineer some acoustic mechanical designs into the microphone, which we call an acoustic labyrinth to affect the directionality or the pickup pattern of the microphone. And we, the way it's done is by using our good friend phase cancellation. 
So we've got sound hitting the front of the microphone and sound going into these ports at the back of the microphone. The sound going into the ports goes through an acoustical mechanical labyrinth and hits the back side of the diaphragm, slightly delayed from the sound hitting the front side of the diaphragm. And the secret sauce in setting that delay is so that certain things will cancel out. Thus, this microphone is very directional, meaning it's going to pick up very well from the front. And as I move off axis on this microphone, the sound's going to drop off hopefully equally across all frequencies until I hit the null point on this microphone, which would be the back end of the microphone if it's a cardioid polar pattern. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of performers out there that like to hold the microphone like this when they are performing. And they don't really understand what's happening, but basically what they're doing, and I usually demonstrate this by taking the head case off the microphone and connecting it to the PA system in the room and covering all of the ports. And all of a sudden I've taken a really good directional microphone and made it into a really awful omnidirectional microphone. And it usually feeds back, which is what I want it to do in this case. And that is the reason why. So I always tell people that microphones are like children. They have a head case and they have a handle. You don't hold your kids by the head, you hold them by the handle. Do the same thing with your microphone. If you do have an artist that insists on cupping the mic because it looks really cool for their genre of music, if they cup it so part of the head case is open, the ports are going to be exposed and the ports will do their thing and they still get that I look really cool on stage look. So that's the reason why. So all microphones are born omnidirectional. The porting and the back chamber, the delay, is what causes them to be directional. We can use that to our advantage, and there's different styles of directionality based on the microphones. And again, like our frequency response curves, the manufacturers have standardized on a polar pattern designation series that allow us to represent our microphones pickup or polar patterns graphically. Again, these are two-dimensional graphs of a three-dimensional thing. So an omnidirectional microphone is like a balloon. It's a sphere around the mic. As I push in on the bottom of that sphere, I start to make it more directional. And as I squeeze this sphere down, I start to make it a little bit tighter pattern. And things happen because it's all physics. So we start from a wide, which is the omnidirectional. We move into the cardioid, which is starting to become directional, to the hypercardioid to the line gradient shotgun, and there is an exception because there's always an exception to the rules, and that's the figure of eight pattern, which is the bidirectional pattern. Typically, microphone manufacturers will do their frequency response or their polar pattern curve at uh, 1K, and their frequency response curve at 1K is the most common measurement frequency. They will also show dotted lines showing the polar patterns at other frequencies because as the frequency increases, the polar pattern can change slightly because um, it can vary at different frequencies. So with that little bit of knowledge, let's take a look at some examples. But of course, we have to digress for a moment. And there are multi-pattern microphones. Primarily in the studio world, you'll see uh, microphones that will allow us to change the polar patterns. And if you watch Lady Gaga on the uh, big TV show on Saturday night, I think it was, and you look closely at the microphone that she had in front of her, it was backwards because you could see the polar pattern switch set for cardioid, and that switch should have been facing her because the front of the microphone was actually facing the viewer. And maybe the production people wanted to show off the brand of microphone, or maybe nobody was paying attention because it was a prop. Who knows? So multi-pattern microphones allow us to change the polar pattern of the microphone uh, by switching a switch or flipping a switch. And what that switch does is it engages two diaphragms in this microphone. It engages the different diaphragms either together or individually to get us the different polar patterns we desire by, by using some circuitry in the microphone. So let's talk about these pickup patterns. I like to say, as Bing Crosby once said, everybody's got a little angle. And if we know the angles, we can make things work. So we're gonna talk about the angles. The two angles we need to know are the angle of acceptance or acceptance angle, and that's a measurement of the optimum coverage of the microphone. Outside the acceptance angle, the performance and the audio level is gonna drop off steeply. It's gonna be determined by the microphone's polar pattern and the physical design of the microphone. 
So I'm using a front, an end address microphone on this diagram. If it's a side address microphone, obviously I'd be talking into the side of the microphone as I am to my 5040. Important thing about this is what sets a good microphone apart from a not as good microphone is how that drop off occurs. And ideally we want it to drop off equally for all frequencies as we go from the uh, as we go from the on axis point of the microphone to the null point or the off axis point. Some cases, microphones don't drop off equally at all frequencies. There might be 2K where it doesn't necessarily drop off as well, and that frequency could be prone to feedback in a live sound situation with floor monitors coming at you. Or it may pick up some undesired sound in a uh, install situation or a studio situation. The null point is a measurement point at which a directional microphone has maximum sound rejection. And that's related to the on-axis point. So that's called the off-axis null point. And it's uh, key in minimizing the effect of acoustical feedback in a live situation, or it's key to minimizing the pickup of undesired sounds in, say, a studio situation. So let's talk about some common polar patterns. The first one that everybody knows is cardioid. And why is it called cardioid? Because if you look at the little diagram, it looks like a, a little heart. 131 degrees is typical cardioid. It's the classic heart-shaped pattern. The null point on a cardioid microphone is 180 degrees off axis or basically at the rear of the microphone, which is ideal because I can put a floor monitor wedge in front of me and blow back sound from the floor monitor wedge and the microphone's not gonna really pick it up as much. It's a great way to control or minimize feedback. Now, if I wanna narrow the angle of acceptance or narrow the pickup pattern, if I want to narrow the angle of acceptance and narrow the pickup pattern, I start to squeeze down the angle of acceptance. I'm squeezing that balloon a little bit. I go to a hypercardioid microphone, about 105 degrees is a typical hypercardioid pickup pattern. And as I squeeze that balloon to narrow that polar pattern while somebody's holding the bottom in to make it a cardioid, something happens. Lo and behold, there's a lobe that appears at the direct rear of the mic. Where the null point was on the cardioid, there is now a little lobe in the hypercardioid, and that lobe is sensitive to sound. So the null point on a hypercardioid moves from a, a 180 degrees off axis to about 110 degrees or 60 degrees off axis, 110 degrees from the other null point. Thus, if I'm using hypercardioid microphones, I need to put two wedges on the floor about 60 degrees apart. As I squeeze the microphone's polar pattern down even tighter, now I'm getting into a line gradient or shotgun microphone, typically 30 degrees angle of acceptance. Notice there's a lot more lobes coming out the back that are sensitive to picking up sound, which is why if I'm using a short shotgun as a boom mic indoors in a film set, I might pick reflections up off the ceiling because there's lobes there. Um, Typically, if I'm doing indoors with a boom mic for a film situation, I'll use a cardioid microphone if I'm dealing with a low ceiling room because of these lobes off the back. The, uh, there is a supercardioid pattern. It is a little bit wider than a hypercardioid. Supercardioid is, uh, uh, Sure uses supercardioid in some of their models. So you go cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid, and then you start getting into the line gradients to answer Joseph's question. Good questions, by the way. Um, and finally, we've got the figure of eight microphone or the bi-directional microphone. Ribbon microphones by design naturally have this pickup pattern. So typically 130 degrees, um, the acceptance angle, the null points now move to 90 degrees off. So if I'm using doing a two-person interview across the table, think Larry King Live, with a bi-directional microphone, I can pick both my talent and guest up just by how I position that microphone. Placing the microphone closer to the softer sound source allows me to balance to the louder sound source using a single microphone. But all of these ribbon microphones, I should say the 44Bs, the 77 has a, an adjustment in it that will make it a cardioid microphone by flipping a little mechanical device inside the microphone. So ribbon mics naturally have this pickup pattern. I can do a multi-pattern studio condenser microphone into a bi-directional as well. And it can be used in, like I say, interview situations and so on. Let's talk about the angles in a real life situation. So here we go, I've got my lead vocalist. Cardioid microphone, wedge monitor right in front of him. Uh, good gain before feedback, good pickup pattern of the, of the performer. 
Now the guy wants to play his acoustic guitar and sing. So I go to a hypercardioid microphone to give him a little bit more distance on that microphone so he can play his guitar. However, because the null point changes, I now have to move the monitors to the 60 degree points. Every once in a while, you'll see a guy with three monitors in front of him. And I always ask the class, what does the third monitor do? If you look closely, the third monitor is often the teleprompter because the vocalist is so old, he's forgotten the words to his hit song from 20 years ago. The bane of a lot of live sound guys' existence, especially in the local bar scene band gigs, and that's the backup singers. So on the left, I've got three background singers that know how to blend. They sing to a single microphone. It's a cardioid microphone. I put the uh, floor wedge monitor right in front of them. They know how to balance. They know how to do their thing. But I've got the situation on the right where, you know, that one background singer happens to be the significant other of the drummer, has to be in the band. You know how the story is, significant other of the drummer has to be in the band. So you give each one their own vocal microphone, you use hypercardioid microphones. You make certain that that significant other backup drummer, backup vocalist, significant other of the drummer, their microphone is really blinged up good so it looks as good as it, um, uh, as it, uh, as it sounds. And now I'm in control of the sound. I do my wedge monitor 60 degrees off. And the only ones that are suffering hearing that bad background singer because that significant other can't carry a tune in a pail are the other two vocalists. And I take it out of the house mix. Yep. I'm checking the questions here. Why do some ribbon mics recommend one side over the other like the Royer 121? Um, Again, I don't know on the Royers, it might be the way the magnet structure fits on that microphone. I know on our ribbon mics and like the uh, the 44, the old 44Bs, both sides are pretty much equal distance. It could be the way the, micro, the uh, uh, magnet structure is in that they prefer one side over the other. The other possibility is also um, phase related. Positive pressure on the front of the microphone is going to give you positive a voltage on pin two of the output cable. So they're probably saying this microphone has a front so you can maintain phase relationships is the other reason I would I would guess that's why they're identifying a specific front or back of the microphone. Uh, let's see, talk got that. All right, good. I'm checking the questions on my little question thing here. Moving on. Pick up resistance, inverse coils of the sound, because we have right, 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 the congregation yells to the sound guy, turn it up. Microphone feeds back. And what does everybody do? They look at the sound guy. What do I tell grandma to do? Move the microphone closer. Closer you are, the louder you get. Moving from one inch to two inches is going to give you a 6 dB drop. Doubling that distance is going to give you another 6 dB a drop. Going, doubling that distance again is going to give you a third 6 dB drop, which means if I go from one inch to eight inches away, I've lost 18 dB of my sound level. It's physics, inverse square law. It's the rule. It's not just a rule. It's the law. It can't be broken. If I could break this law, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be on a beach in Acapulco. Well, maybe not with coronavirus, but I would be, uh, I'd be like doing something else and wallowing in money if I could make a mic that would do that. Anyway. Pickup versus distance, laws of physics, the closer you are, the louder you get, will give you a better signal to noise ratio as well. Um, oh, that's a good question. If two singers are on either side of a figure eight mic wearing ears, will out of phase of their voices affect the mix in their ears? That's a great question. I have I, that would be something I'd have to try and see. I really would, because I've only really used a figure of eight mic in a vocal situation with a guest and a and a talker. Um, thanks, Pete. That's a good. That's uh, experimentation time. Working distance. Microphones do not have reach. I get this all the time from uh, 
uh, uh, independent video guys. I want a shotgun microphone because it's got reach. It's going to reach out and grab that sound. Unfortunately, microphones don't have reach. Microphones will have a working distance, and I can increase my working distance based on the environment I'm in and the pickup pattern of the microphone. As I get into uh, a noisier environment, I've got to be closer. I can work, I can increase my working distance by also going to a tighter pickup pattern. A hypercardioid is going to give me a greater working distance, all their can, things made the same, than an omnidirectional microphone. Um, some microphones are going to give me more rejection. The classic is the parabola. It's going to give me great rejection. It's going to give me a real tight pickup pattern. It's not going to give me more reach. If you listen when they crank the parab up on a, a football game, you're going to hear the background noise come up as well because it's just giving me a real, real, real tight pattern and great rejection. Um, I love the consumer grade microphones that I see that are called telephoto microphones. It's not like a telephoto lens on a camera. It's not going to bring the subject closer. It's going to eliminate more background noise, but the guy is still going to sound like he's 10 feet away, even though I can zoom in on him on my camera. And by the way, in, uh, in, in the UK, uh, uh, oftentimes they'll call what we call a shotgun microphone, the rifle microphone. When I do this thing live, I did one of these for a, uh, a whole bunch of uh, film guys at a film school. So I carried my little suitcase full of shotgun microphones. I hand carried on the plane and the TSA guy says, what's in the case, sir? I said, shotguns. And then about three hours later, I realized that was not the right thing to say. Should have said microphones. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> Sound pressure level SPL. It's the maximum SPL rating in microphones. We'll see that on a lot of specifications. It's primarily in condenser microphones because of the electronics in the microphone. Um, dynamic mics will handle an unlimited SPL. In fact, at one time, I think it was Sennheiser used to do an ad where they shot a starter's pistol off next to the 421, saying this microphone will handle that loud of a sound source. And they were correct because the uh, um, a dynamic microphone will handle just about an unlimited amount of SPLs. It's a lot of sound. Max SPL is a lot of sound on a microphone before distortion. Obviously, larger the value is better. Dynamic microphones will typically handle an unlimited amount of SPLs. Sometimes condenser microphones will have a pad switch in them that will allow the microphone to handle a larger amount of SPL. It pads the input to that amplifier. Um, let's see, I'm trying to read this question. Uh, wasn't there, little thing is in the way here. You gotta wait for the little, there it goes. Was there a mic super rejecting ambient noise and acted almost like a parab? Um, Yes, Peter Erskine, that microphone was called the 895. It was made by Audio-Technica. It was a DSP-controlled microphone, and unfortunately, we thought it was going to be a replacement for parabola, but in reality, it wasn't the replacement for a parab, but in certain situations, it would literally make background sound go away. Uh, had a, it ran on four 9-volt batteries uh, for the DSP pack. It was an early... Uh, foray into DSP controlled microphones. I own one. It's a pretty unique piece, um, but uh, we just continued it a long time ago, and I don't know the reason why. Hi, well, Pete. because it, it sort of looked weird. It was a, a, a long, skinny mic with a softball on the top of it. Big softball. Uh, our, and, ours, uh, ours was like yeah. a looked like a short squat shotgun that uh, our well, it had a, the one I would do, I said I saw a demo of it at NAB with uh, uh, I think the greens were there if I'm not mistaken yes and uh, we went out into the parking lot and stood near two buses with our engines on yep barely could talk mouth to mouth we just had headphones on Mike was 10 feet away from us and we clearly heard our voices coming through without yes, any I... of the truck noise Remember the demo? We try. The yep. problem was it was a really cool thing for that type of application, and unfortunately, we tried to market it as a replacement for the parab for distance, like at sporting events, and it didn't really do the same as a parab. It wasn't as tight of a pattern as a parab, and if it did, it, parab sort of amplifies a cone, and it yes. like, like because it's got a parab, because it's got a parab. And so people were trying to use it as a parab replacement and they, they weren't having success with it. So it kind of, unfortunately, it kind of died on the vine. Um, let's see, I got a response on the figure of eight question. I gotta wait for the little, the little names pop up on, I have to wait for them to go away before I can read the whole question on my little screen here. 
So um, let's see. Uh, okay, because the voices are different frequencies, a pure tone would probably cause phase cancellation. That sounds more plausible in the myth busting thing, but I definitely want to try the figure of eight with two voices. And I'm going to, uh, next time I do, a, I do a live stream, I'm going to take a figure of eight mic and put two people in front of it and try it. So I do my live stream concerts and we'll see what happens. And I will report back to uh, uh, practicalshowtech.com guys and uh, let them put it up as like, uh, you know, revisiting the myth as they say. Um, high pass or low cut filter, useful tools they are. I'd like to say engage the low cut filter on all condenser microphones except for desired low frequency sources. It's gonna minimize mechanical noise pickup of things like cable noise. It's also gonna minimize pickup of sounds coming through the mic stands and those kind of rumbles and rattles. Vocals will pop out on the mix. I tell this to all the recording students. Um, if you don't have a low cut filter on the mic, roll it off on the console or the mic free has got a low cut filter. Um, Please mention why a shotgun mic isn't the best choice in poor acoustics and why. The big issue with a shotgun, I don't know if this is in a live sound situation or a voice situation. The big issue with a shotgun microphone is it's got all these lobes on the backside that will pick up reflections. If you're trying to boom inside a small room or a low ceiling room, it will, um, it will pick up all these reflections off the ceiling and you're going to get little echoes or or little little artifacts in your dialogue because it's picking all those uh, those sounds up. Um, yes, in film sound, that is correct. That's why I don't recommend a, a shotgun microphone in a low ceiling or indoor room where you've got lots of uh, uh, reverberant. You've got lots of things coming off of other reflective surfaces in the room. Primarily the ceiling is where I've had the worst issue with it. A real high ceiling room, not necessarily an issue. But if we go back to the shotgun mic's polar pattern, you look at the, the null point and there's all these little off-axis lobes coming at the rear of that microphone. A shotgun mic in a high ceiling room or a long shotgun mic in an outdoor situation will give you a much greater working distance and a good off-axis rejection. A shotgun mic in on a boom in a, in a room with a low to mid-high ceiling, you're going to get a lot of ceiling reflections and that's where those things are all coming from. Um, and I think I got that. Um, so I'll move on. Polarity and phase. This gets back at the uh, uh, possibly why a ribbon microphone says this is the preferred side. Um, polarity is wave relationship over time. Polarity is electrical con connections. And I see these little things. That was a Radio Shack phase reverser. It's actually a polarity reverser. It's flipping the electrical con electrical connections on pin two and three of the three pin microphone connector. A lot of people will buy these little inline tubes. There might be a switch on a mic pre, a switch on an input channel. It looks like a no smoking sign. That's gonna reverse the polarity. Normally a microphone manufacturer specifies that positive pressure on the diaphragm results in a positive voltage on pin two of the output connector. Reversing that polarity means a positive pressure on the diaphragm results in a positive voltage on pin three of the connector. If I'm doing a top and bottom snare drum situation in a studio, I will reverse the phase or reverse the polarity so the two diaphragms are working like push-pull loudspeakers are going like this in relation to the snare drum instead of like doing this. So they're gonna work together like so instead of doing this. If I do this, I get a clap. So that's the polarity versus phase. So it's kind of a misnomer. It's not actually reversing the phase in general. It's reversing the polarity. Um, phantom power, love phantom power. Phantom power was invented by Neumann to be exact. Before phantom power, there was something called T power for those that do remember back in the good old days. And it allows us to deliver a voltage on the same two conductor shielded cable used to carry my audio signal. It only works with balanced lines for obvious reasons uh, because I'm putting my voltage between the two signal leads in reference to the shield or ground on this audio line. 
Voltage ranges from 9 to 52 volts DC, with 48 volts being the most common. I have some uh, Neumann, uh, old, old Neumann microphones that really preferred 52 volts phantom power. And I have an old Neumann uh, phantom power supply that will give me the 52 volts output. I use it for recording symphonies. Phantom power sources can be mixers, preamps, or interfaces, or maybe an external uh, phantom power supply, uh, an inline power supply, some of the early mixers. I had an old Tascam mixer that didn't have phantom power. Uh, and a battery in a microphone isn't true phantom power. The battery in the microphone is actually supplying the DC bias voltage. A little microphone trivia, and I always ask this question to the group. So we all know what that connector is called, right? That three pin snap on microphone connector. We all call it the ubiquitous XLR. And this is the six point bonus question on my midterm. What does XLR stand for? A lot of video guys will yell ground left and right. No, nope, that's not it. Or somebody will come up with some other weird, you know, ground and signal one, signal two. XLR actually means the X series connector made by the Canon ITT company. And Canon is spelled C-A-N-N-O-N. L stands for latch or lock, and R stands for rubber or resilient because the original XLR connectors had a rubber insert. Before the XLR connector was something called the P connector, which was about an inch in diameter, if not larger. And before that, there were some really obscure connectors. In fact, even at one time, Hubble twist lock plugs were used for audio. Um, Peter Erskine is correct. The RCA 44B vintage ribbon microphone has a center tap transformer. The center tap went to the ground. So if you connected that microphone with the center tap connected and didn't go in and modify the microphone, if you plug that into phantom power, you basically shorted the signal through the ribbon. Ribbon acted like a fuse and protected my phantom power supply. Unfortunately, when the ribbon acted like a fuse, I lost the ribbon in the microphone, which is why when I brought the ribbon mics out for today, I made certain that neither of them, neither of them were plugged into anything even coming close to phantom power in my studio. Um, when I do bring the ribbons out to record with, I make sure that phantom power is turned off everywhere, even on equipment that it's, I'm not using. So does phantom power affect dynamic microphones? This question is on my final, and if you leave it blank, the answer is correct, because it does not. Because if you look at the circuitry diagram, the signal leads go to the two wires coming off the coil, and the shield is not connected anywhere. So plugging a dynamic microphone into a circuit with phantom power on it won't damage the microphone or harm the phantom power, won't load the phantom power down. But yes, it can damage some vintage ribbon mic because the center tap transformer, which we just talked about, the current flow can cause that ribbon to blow like a fuse, which really upsets the owner of the microphone quite a bit. So I always say, if you are gonna use your ribbon microphones for recording, uh, be very careful when you are connecting them or disconnect the center tap to ground on the transformer. Uh, doesn't XLR mean cross-laced receptacle? No, it does not. It's the X series by Canon, latching and rubber insert. Thanks, Frank, for that uh, good question. Comments. So. I have to tell you, I was I was in New York City the other oh, a couple months ago before all this corona came down. I was standing in Times Square, and uh, this man hopped out of a fast taxi and said, I've got a phantom power adapter for you. And he wanted to sell me this smoking hot microphone phantom, phantom power adapter. He said it'll make cheap microphones sound really expensive, and expensive microphones sound really hot. And as they say, audio feelies everywhere know that more power is better. So for $9.99, $22 west of the Mississippi, you can order yours online today. And there is a big disclaimer on the bottom. And my little friend over there said, my expensive microphone worked really great until I plugged it in. So needless to say, if you see this guy coming, run as fast as you can in the other direction. So I'm uh, moving, I guess I'm doing pretty good on time and answering the questions. So I'm going to run through real quick some microphone techniques for the really, really tough stuff. And I do this because I get these questions all the time from the college students when I'm doing the recording classes. And I thought, well, I might as well just get them out of the way and you guys can take them however you want them. Because I'm basing this on years of audio experience and just all around common sense. 
Here are some insider secrets on how to make some of the more challenging sound sources out there. And I'll start with one of my all-time favorites, the banjo. Don't, no offense to banjo players anywhere. If I was making a banjo, I'd probably use a small diaphragm condenser and I'd kind of go for kind of just a distant spacing on it. But banjo players, they all laugh. And of course, the next one is my second favorite instrument to mic, and that is the accordion. And although most accordion players that I do know, uh, I'll use a dual pickup in the accordion because it is a difficult instrument to really mic because you're dealing with sound coming out of both ends of the accordion. So a lot of accordion players have a dual pickup or dual microphone unit inside the accordion. And of course, the other one is my third all-time favorite, and that is the bagpipes. And then, you know, I do this class, and I find these kind of fun little pictures on the stock photography websites, and I buy them for a dollar a piece. And I found this one, and I put this picture up, and I go, what is wrong with this photo? And it's some nice woman singing. She's hand-holding a Audio-Technica tube condenser. That's our 4060. There is no cable plugged into the microphone. It is in a microphone stand. She's hand-holding it, and uh, but she is really happy. So I guess, I guess she's okay. I saw this. Somebody said, well, how many microphones do you put on a, a lectern or a podium? And I said, not two. And I was doing a gig once, and I had a young intern that was his first day on the job. And I said, I need you to put a mic on the Marshall lamp. And he said, okay. And I brought out Thrash Kitty just to kind of shred a little bit. And then, of course, there's always the, you know, we're in a pinch. How do we mic the sax player? I don't think that's going to work. And last but not least, this is actually real. Um, I do a, a drum miking version of this class with a hands-on lab portion. This is uh, Terry Bossio's drum set at the DW facility in Oxnard, California. I did a video there uh, a few years back, and I got to sit behind Terry Bossio's kit. He's got chromatically tuned toms and more drums than I've ever seen in one place at one time. So it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, this is kind of one of the first stopping points, and I'm willing to go on if you guys want to on this and, and maybe answer any more specific questions. There's a lot more on our website as well. Um, there's a guide to AT products, obviously. There's a real basic fundamentals for like church folks on our thing, as well as uh, applications for our wireless and so on and so on and so forth. Um, but that's uh, a little bit about uh, the fundamentals of uh, of the frequency of, of the physics of microphones. Here we got another question that just popped in. Here, let me see if I can grab it. I have heard that cardioid microphones inherently have more handling noise than omni mics, which is physically unavoidable. And it's part of when it's part of the directionality aspect of the cardioid microphone. And you are correct. They do have a little bit more handling noise. And we as manufacturers strive to minimize that or find frequencies where the handling noise is either lower than what the microphone's picking up to, to try and minimize that. But cardioid microphones will inherently have more handling noise than omnidirectional microphones. Um, and it's part of the way the mic, it's part of the design of the microphone. Um, it's part of the acoustic back chamber on the microphone. There's no acoustic back chamber on the, on uh, an omni microphone. It is basically just the the capsule and the diaphragm. You've got that whole acoustic labyrinth, and that's dealing with primarily rejecting lower frequencies to make it cardioid. So you're getting into uh, some of that stuff is also where you're getting more mechanical noise on the microphone. So that can that question came from Ken Newman. Thank you, Ken, on that question. Uh, Pete, Kelly, do you want to jump in? Uh, we're at a break point here. I can talk a little bit about miking some different things, primarily a mix of studio and live stuff. It's your you're driving it. I, I think uh, uh, some miking recommendation for various instruments uh, in, in various situations, like a live small band, large orchestral uh, situations, what you would do. Okay. And, uh, uh, and there were a couple of questions in there about proximity effect as well. Okay, prox let's, I didn't talk about proximity effect because I'll talk about proximity in two ways, and it's something I haven't put into the formal presentation. Everybody knows what proximity effect is, and it's again, it's a directional microphone because of 
you've got that acoustic labyrinth. As you move closer to a directional microphone, you will get an increase in low frequencies. That's the proximity effect, right? You know, it's the old one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five. So you're getting that proximity effect. A lot of vocalists like that because they'll use that to give them a little bit more, more warmth in their voice. Some vocalists hate it. An omnidirectional microphone by its design will not have that proximity effect. Now, I use the word proximity in another aspect, and I talk about a proximity style microphone as opposed to a transparent style microphone, primarily in the film world. And a proximity style microphone means as I move away from the microphone, my level is going to drop off rapidly, meaning I have to be in close proximity to the microphone to get a decent sound pickup. Dynamic microphones typically have uh, our proximity style microphones, meaning as I move away from the mic, the level drops off very quickly, which is good because they're going to help minimize the pickup of background noise. you got to work the microphone closer. It also means that if I'm using them as drum overhead microphones, and the, they're not going to work too well on that type of situation because they need to be close to the sound source. A transparent style microphone, which a lot of condensers are, as you move away from the microphone, the level drops off gradually. Drops off gradually. So instead of a, a proximity style microphone, and I'll, I'll do this just as a demo, is like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, two, three, four. Where a transparent style microphone is one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five. It drops off lower. Um, uh, I got a yes. I'll uh, um, let's see. Uh, we can stay on Q and A. I'm getting messages coming in on my little Q and A thing. Um, I am happy to stay on Q and A, and I'll talk about miking some things. So in a film situation, by using a transparent style lav mic, it's going to be more sensitive to other sounds around it, but it will also intercut better with a boom mic. Using a proximity style lav mic, using my term proximity, that microphone is going to be, uh, it's going to pick up the source it's close to. And it's going to minimize the pickup of un, uh, unwanted sounds. So we can use that to our advantage, transparent style versus proximity style, meaning you need to work the mic close versus you can work the mic a little bit further away, primarily in the film app, film applications. So I'm going to jump into um, close miking techniques versus distant miking techniques. I'm an ensemble recordist when I do my, uh, my uh, symphony work and my choral work. And I'm using things like the XY pair, the ORTF pair, spaced omni pairs, and so forth. I'm using a smaller number of microphones to pick up a large number of performers, ensemble miking. Most live sound work and a lot of studio work and pop music and stuff, we're using closer micro, close mic, close miking techniques. The closer you are, the more detailed, the more intimate, and the drier the sound is going to be. However, if you're using directional microphones, the more low end you're going to pick up because of proximity effect. As you move further away from the sound source, you're going to get more diffused and open sounds, maybe less intimate, more room ambience, but also a greater feedback potential as your uh, gain before feedback decreases. Frequency and directivity. Higher frequency sounds are going to be more directional. Lower frequency sounds are going to be more non-directional, regardless of the pickup pattern of the microphone. So even though I'm using a directional microphone, low frequency sounds in the room are still going to be more omnidirectional. Larger diaphragm microphones on low frequency instruments, uh, smaller diaphragm microphones on higher frequency instruments. And even though I work for a microphone company and I own a ton of microphones, more is not always better. If I can get away with fewer microphones to get the job done, I'd prefer to do that. But it's not always the case. Um, singers and talkers. I tell a vocalist if they can come up and own their own microphone, find a microphone that works with your voice. A guitar player is going to go out and he's going to try a whole bunch of different guitars. He's going to find one that's comfortable and easy to play and gives him the sound he wants. A lot of vocalists will walk into the nightclub and they'll use that radial microphone that's sitting on the stage because it's the microphone. So I always tell a vocalist, what is their timbre? What's their style? What's their voice sound like? The microphone should enhance their vocal. 
They shouldn't have to work hard to get the sound they want. Find a microphone that works great for them. I had a vocalist I put six different mics on just to try them out. And the mic that sounded best on her voice was the $99 Dynamic. Even though my $400 handheld condenser, which I thought would sound better, just didn't work for that singer's voice. She had kind of a raspy, kind of a Janis Joplin sounding voice. And, and in, in this case, the lesser expensive microphone worked. Uh, condenser microphones will handle an extended frequency response. They'll handle more overtones and harmonics. However, if the vocalist doesn't know how to use a condenser mic, it might get away from them. Dynamic microphones are going to have more of a tailored vocal response. They're going to have that presence peak. They'll handle a higher SPL for a screamer. If you've got some guy that's a metal singer or a you know, high-energy vocalist, and they're going to really scream their vocals out, I'd probably put them on a dynamic microphone. I've actually had vocalists in my studio where they'll use their, a handheld microphone because they're more comfortable in singing that way. They use the microphone as a tool. Um, in a studio, a microphone slightly above the performer's mouth cuts down on unwanted popping, sibilance, and breath sounds. In theater, believe it or not, and I do this demonstration live with a handheld mic, putting the microphone here at the hairline is a great place to put the microphone because your voice travels up and around your face. The second place to put the microphone is the so-called ear rig, if I'm going to put a microphone here on a theater actor. Um, but putting the microphone slightly above the vocalist, whether it's a, uh, a vocalist in a studio um, or uh, a performance in a broadcast situation, in a, in a live sound situation, and that's kind of tough because it's in the way of their face. It also allows the person to read the lyrics if they're in a studio. Um, putting a lav mic on an actor. I tell people, put the lav mic, thumb, put their thumb on, not my thumb, put their thumb on their lower lip and where their pinky finger hits their chest, that's where I would put the lav mic. I've seen so many people put a lav mic on an actor like midway down on where the tie tack is. And again, this is the best place to put a lav mic on me. My pinky, my thumb on my lip, my pinky on my chest. And it's gonna get the mic in the best position. Um, Position the vocalist on stage to prevent leakage into the microphone. A dynamic microphone is going to be less susceptible to picking up on other unwanted sounds from the background. A condenser is going to be a little bit more susceptible to picking that stuff up. Um, let's see. Got the handling noise. Oh, more questions. Let me roll down the questions. Um, why does proximity affect? We talked about proximity. Do I have miking? Yes, I do. I'll get into those in a minute. Um, how about why some cardio directional headsets are more susceptible to wind than Omni? Um, again, directional microphones, because you've got the sound coming in the back ports as opposed to an Omni. There's no back ports on an Omni that any sound, any wind noise is also going to get into those ports as well. And it's going to affect how that, and that low frequency responds on the mic. Um, let's see, an RTF MS Decatree. Uh, yes, if I can, uh, we'll see how time goes. Uh, I have I have heard of people using distilled water to clean lav elements. You have to be careful with getting any kind of moisture inside that capsule because any kind of moisture can potentially damage that. Um, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, our miniature laws will come with a device called a makeup cap. We put over the lav capsule so you can take the makeup cap off and you can clean the makeup cap. Um, I have my kind of ruin or mask higher frequencies, possibly. Um, uh, preferred side for a lav dominate hands. Oh, dominant hand side. So, if I'm using a lav mic, if I'm using a lav mic and it's an omnidirectional lav, it doesn't matter how it's being mounted. If I'm using a cardioid lav, I want the cardioid lav oriented in such a way that I need to, how the talent's speaking. So if I'm doing two people on a news set and this guy's constantly looking this way, I would favor the law of on this side. And hey, Pete, I need to take a two second break because I drank a big glass of water and I need to give it back. So okay, can I- no problem, no problem, we I, got it. Can I let you guys do a thing on the questions and I will be, I'll leave my camera up, but, I Remember to turn your mic off when you go. A 16 ounce water in the midst of a two hour webinar. Well, you obviously aren't wearing your webinar diaper like I am. Yeah, so, uh, yeah you'll know better exactly. next time. I'll know better exactly. the next time, but I will be right back. I'm sorry to run, but boy, my.
My bladder's too small in my old age. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Anyway, um, the uh, Greg Story asked, I don't think he covered this, how much of a compromise due to low profile mic is a headset mic when used in high ambient environments? Um, The whole point of using a headset mic is you get the mic closer to your mouth. And uh, uh, typically, uh, you, the headset mics are used when uh, you have a lot of people on the stage, much preferable to putting lavaliers on everybody, particularly if everybody's talking. Um, yeah, in a PA situation, the closer the mic is to the mouth, the better the game before feedback. And, if and they may even be omni mics. They may, may even be omni mics, but since they're right next to your mouth, they don't have to be turned up as loud. Right. Um, we will have to have a with Broadway um, A2s, which have to deal on a daily basis, which I think we have coming up next week, a daily basis cleaning the law of mics and the mics that go in people's hair and everywhere else. Um, uh, I know that a lot of Broadway shows treat lavalier mics as expendables because they don't last very long. Uh, and that may be the solution. If it gets dirty, you take it off, you throw it away, get another one. Um, yeah, a lot of times when they get sweated out where they lose, they get wet and so the high frequency response goes away and they become very dull sounding. Uh, sometimes those can be dried out. Steve's uh, suggested uh, in uncooked rice because that's a hydroscopic absorption. I usually water. use brown rice. I find brown yeah. rice is a much yeah. more healthy way to dry your mics up. Yeah, sometimes you can get that to come back, but uh, on Broadway, once it once it gets sweated out, it's usually like thrown into a spares box so that you know if you have a total failure on a mic you can maybe grab that as an emergency uh or sometimes uh, the stage hands take them home and give them to their local church and we uh, we all know that many shows are lip synced and there's nothing yeah. a shame about that you can get a much better recording in the studio and then do your performance i mean think back to the years when they first started doing videos the people weren't using mics at all. There was no mics on the people at all. They were out there singing and dancing, and it sounded great because they recorded in the studio. But, oh, Steve's back. I'm going to have to tell the rest of this story later. No, I'll tell it now. So every year I do uh, the Macy's Day Parade. And uh, uh, for years, we had a bunch of broken mics owned by uh, NBC uh, that we would use on the floats for people uh, who were lip syncing on the floats when they came down to do their thing. And then a few years ago, five, six years ago, we had Superstorm Sandy came through New York and totally flooded out the NBC warehouse and all the mics were were just moldy and no good anymore. So for two or three years, the Macy Parade used SM58s with an XLR and a little cable wire sticking out. And of course, every single time we did the parade, there were thousands of comments on the audio uh, forums about what, what, how this, how bad this looks. And of course, 99% of the people in the United States thought it was a wireless mic or didn't think one way or the other. And then came uh, selling off the 600 band spectrum and all manufacturers had some kind of trade-in deal for your 600 megahertz wireless and they would just take those back and, and destroy them because they could, the electronics basically had to be totally destroyed. So that came along, uh, Steve arranged for me to have 25 beautifully uh, uh, looking Audio-Technica mics to use in the parade. So if you see an Audio-Technica mic in the parade, that's a little triangle on the bottom of the mic that says, it might not be an actual mic. I won't say which <laughs> ones are and which ones are. They were the easiest ones you've ever had to coordinate, right? Oh, no. Well, they took a lot of time to coordinate. And I always put give a certificate to the A2s to say, here's the box of coordinated wireless. <laughs> well, I am back. I I, I've learned a big lesson today on this webinar, and that is don't do three cups of coffee for breakfast and yeah. then top it off with this. <laughs> After three weeks, I've learned that lesson quite well. Well, and I will 
And a, a question I would like to see addressed, and I don't actually know the answers to, I would be uh, John Christie's questions about uh, ORTF uh, mid-side and XY configurations. Okay. Um, so those are all distant miking techniques. Um, the classic one that everybody knows is the XY, which is the two capsules done like this. Gives you a very wide stereo field with no hole in the middle. Um, the uh, other one is the ORTF. ORTF, and, and it's a French type configuration. It's a spread this way. Now I do a symphony and I use an ORTF pair because I like the spacing on that mic to cover my upstage winds. Um, the third one that he talked about, I'm gonna skip one. Uh, the third one he talked about is the Deca tree. And the Deca tree is a three microphone set up using three omnidirectional microphones. Um, and they are in a kind of an inverted T. Uh, it's about from the center of the T to an edge is about 32 inches, give or take, if my numbers are right. And the inverted T is suspended so that the center of the T is over the conductor's head and then the two flanks are, are behind him. And I use a Deca tree for my main symphony hang. Because the stage in my orchestra's uh, venue is very wide and shallow, I supplement that with two outriggers. And yes, even though I work for Audio Technica, I own, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, ten original Neumann KM84s, which are absolutely the sweetest sounding orchestral mics um, that I've used. I use for that symphony. I use, um, I use the Deca Tree and the two outriggers. That's five, and then I use two more for the ORTF pair, and then I've got a, I have a couple of spares. The third one is called Midside or MS. And mid-side is a technique where I take a figure of eight microphone and I place a cardioid microphone above it. So I've got my cardioid microphone here and my hand is my figure of eight. And I take the cardioid output is known as the mid and the figure of eight output is known as the side. And this technique allows you to widen or narrow the stereo field by the relationship or the ratio between the mid and side between the mid and the side using something called a mid side decoder uh, a lot of the field mixers like the sound devices and some of the other uh location sound mixers will have a mid side function built into it so i take the mid which is my cardioid that goes into an input i take the side uh, output from that condenser mic, and it goes to two more inputs. And there's a matrix that that does some uh, some things in there that allows me to, on two controls, vary the ratio between the mid or the cardioid and the sides, and it'll literally make the stereo field open and close. And you can widen that stereo field, and you can close that stereo field down by doing that. So that got. Um, uh, let's see, I took care of mid-side XY and ORTF and then the Deca tree. Uh, recording classical music with a Deca tree is phenomenal. The, the only downside is I have a starboard boom, which you can't see, which is a pretty high mic stand to do a field location. But in my symphony hall, the Deca tree is pre-hung. So there's, uh, there's nothing in front of the orchestra. A uh, question came in. Um, the right way to use an Audio Technica BPHS1. That is one of our um, uh, sportscaster broadcaster headsets, and it's a dual element or it's a, a uh, micro dynamic microphone with a hypercardioid pattern, as opposed to a cardioid pattern. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I use it. I use the. Yeah, it is a KM80. I have KM84 capsules. I also have the KM85, which I think is the Omni capsule. It's tough when you're old trying to remember all these numbers. Uh, but I have I have two sets of capsules for those mics. Um, I use the KM80, the Omni capsules on the Deca tree and the Outriggers, and I use the cardioids on the RTF pair. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, you guys are getting me on these numbers. So I, 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 when you say, is there a right way to use a BPHS-1, I need a little bit more clarification on that question. Just a... It is a good headset microphone for like a sports situation. Um, 
I think you can also split the ear cups if you want to, because it is a stereo headset. So you could send a uh, director into one ear cup and, uh, and program audio into the other ear cup. Um, so let's see, I've got that, got that. So let's, I'll move on onto some miking things. Question comes up, how do I mic a choir? I've got an ensemble of singing voices. Um, a lot of people will try and put a lot of mics on the choir. And what we like to go by is something called the three to one rule. And the three to one rule states the distance between any two microphones on that choir should be at least three times the distance between a microphone and the closest person or the front row. So if I've got my row of microphones are six feet from the first singer in the choir, the ratio between those microphones should be six times three or 18 feet. So on a fairly large choir, I can get away with a, a, a relatively small number of microphones. And I treat that choir, as most choir directors would want it to be treated as a single ensemble or a single voice. If you get too many microphones on the choir, all of a sudden you start hearing individual voices of the choir. <clears throat> so um, thus the three to one rule. So the three to one rule, distance between any microphone should be greater than three times the distance between a microphone and the closest person. The other issue, if you've got two microphones that are too close together, is you'll get some phasing issues. The classic example is two microphones on a podium. And you'll see this all the time. You'll see two microphones on a lectern or a, a presenter. So I'm using my thumbs for this. I don't have two microphones in front of me here. They're all packed away. And what happens is people say, well, I'll put two microphones on the podium so that if the guy's talking this way, this mic will pick him up. If he's talking this way, this mic will pick him up. Well, he gets kind of right in the middle where phase cancellation takes place, and all of a sudden he just cuts out. And I do this, I actually did it as a live demo in the in the class when I've got the sound system up, and you can I can actually find that sweet spot and I'll be talking, and then all of a sudden it just literally goes away. The voice just cuts out. So the best number of microphones on a podium is one single mic in the center. Now, oftentimes you'll see like previous presidents will have a three mic cluster on the podium. Normally, one of those is a broadcast pool mic, one is a PA system feed mic, and the third mic is a spare. Uh, the current administration uses a single microphone on a mic stand, on a gooseneck, because he likes to play with the microphone. Oftentimes, you'll see the uh, Shep's uh, retractable mics on an award show. You'll see the two big, giant Q-tip heads. Um, oftentimes, one of those is a hypercardioid microphone, and the other is a cardioid microphone. And what the, uh, the A1 will do is if it's a person that's standing away from the mic and a single person accepting the award, it'll engage the hypercardioid mic to give you more working distance. If you've got a group of people, you'll use the cardioid mic to get the wider pickup pattern. Um, a lot of times with two is a main and a backup um, or different polar patterns as well. We just I just hit on that. That came from James Burke. Um, and... Uh, I have some uh, I have some special uh, multi-element podium mics that would have a uh, hypercardioid capsule in them and a cardioid capsule, which we used to use for the presidential debates. I still have those mics. Um, and they, again, so if you're far away, you can get more working distance on the hyper capsule. If you have multiple people behind the lectern or podium, you can get um, uh, a wider uh, angle of acceptance. And then, Kelly, do you have any of your special podium mics handy? Kelly, do you have any of your special podium mics handy? I do. I, I have, have my mine. secret stash. I have my secret stash as well, and they're they're just all here. So here yeah, and available, they say. Uh, yeah, I've got my shirts well, that we used last uh, cycle around as well. But mm -hmm. uh, Are you I don't really want to get into a brand war work? right now. <laughs> What's that? So, uh, Nothing. I'm going to show you the BPH one because I, I see what his question is about here. Okay. Um, this is the uh, BPH one right here. And I'm sure what he is interested in knowing is how does that point? Does it go underneath your lip? Does it go over your lip? I mean, it's basically an L shaped headset boom. Yes. Well, the, the it's like a hypercardioid capsule with the on axis coming in at that little grill. And there's a windscreen that covers it. So the on axis is coming. I'm pointing to this picture, which nobody can see but but Pete. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, they see yeah. it. Yeah. So they if you move it. your if you move your mouse around to the tip of the capsule, that's that's the on axis tip, the front of that. 
So normally I would put that just slightly below the person's mouth. So they're kind of talking over it to help minimize breath plosives into the capsule. And it also comes so with a pretty of good- shooting up maybe into their nose? Yeah, so it's kind of pointing towards their nose a little bit. It is a it's As a fairly direct right capsule. in front of them, straight in front of them, right? It'll it'll minimize P pops or breath plosives as you're coming out. So I got okay, the question I'm gonna, now. I'm going to give you back the control here. Okay. Um, subcardioid MK21 for coral pickup. I normally use. Go ahead, go ahead, and share your screen if you want to. Uh, okay, I will. Uh, do that and i will do there we go um so as mentioned the subcardioid mk21 for coral pickup uh again i've i've used a cardioid pattern the subcardioid pattern is going to give you a little bit narrower uh pickup and my three to one rule i still follow the three to one rule even if i use a hypercardioid on a choir on a coral group the hypercardioids will give me a little bit more working distance between the if i have to get the mics out further away from the choir and I'm scrolling through the questions. I can move on the slides. You guys tell me, give me the direction to go here. Go on, go on. I'm moving on, okay. Acoustic guitar, this is my, this is the big animation. When I'm gonna bring on the acoustic guitar player and what I do is I use my ear and I basically do this. I listen. That's my whole cheesy animation in the entire deal. So, I want to try and capture the tonal balances between all these different parts that are resonating in this thing. Um, and a lot of times the player will use that and when he's and it, to affect his sound. Um, if I get too close to the acoustic guitar, I'll get an unbalanced sound. And again, we have to remember this is a three-dimensional image and a two-dimensional screen. So that microphone is pointing at the guitar, not coming from underneath the guitar. So if you take the small diaphragm condenser, because you want to pick up all the nuances and the detail. A single microphone pointing, again, we're pointing at the guitar, not under the guitar. Pointing near the 12th fret will get a little bit more mellow tone and more finger or string sounds. A single mic near that center hole is going to give me more boominess because that center hole is projecting, uh, that's the projection point. But it's going to be more boominess or more bassy sound if that's the style the player is playing. It's also more susceptible to pick and string noise. If I move the mic closer to the bridge, I'll reduce the pick and string noise, but I'm also going to get more wood off the more woodiness off the body of the guitar and may lack detail. So sometimes in a studio, what I'll do is put two mics on the guitar, one partway between the bridge and the hole, and the other up near the 12th fret. Um, subcardioid, no, subcardioid is narrower than a cardioid. I have to, I, it's cardioid, subcardioid, hypercardioid. If you look at the chart from Shure, um, going back on Peter Mason's question. Subcardioid is wider than the hypercardioid. The cardioid is still wider. If I go by this, the chart that I've seen on the Shure website. Um, there's also contact mics to attach to acoustic instruments. And it's basically a small lav that will fit in that sound hole on an acoustic guitar. Um, I've had players in a studio situation put the microphone above over the player's shoulder and come down. Uh, we've lost your audio, Steve. We've lost Steve's audio. Lips were moving just fine. We weren't hearing anything. Interesting. Still nothing. So, Mac, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. And I, I, I had a comment also, which Steve was talking about. Yeah. Moving the mic around the guitar. One. I, I used to work with a... Uh, here, Mac. Composer who almost all of his compositions involved two nine foot Steinways, some of them sometimes four. And uh, I spent a lot of time sticking my head inside pianos, listening for sweet spots on for the high and the low mic on a concert. One, two, three, four. Am I back? We, got, we have, we got to ask. 
You're that back. You're back. I, I don't know what happened. I, my little green bars were moving, but nothing was coming out. Welcome to the interweb. It's all yeah. good. It's live it's webinaring. All, it's all good. Okay, a question just came in. We get to Omni mics. Can we talk about the differences between free field, diffuse field, and pressure field? Um, I'm, 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 I have to say I don't know the answer to that question. Um, these are these are deep questions here. Um, now, are you talking about are you talking about like a pressure zone? Because a pressure zone is a plate style microphone, which uses a capsule. There's a a capsule suspended over a plate with a very small opening. That's the pressure zone. I'm not certain. I'd have to dig out my uh, my microphone handbook to get into the, the free field, diffuse field, and pressure field. I know that there's a pressure gradient in a cardioid mic, and mics all operate on pressure. But I'm going to have to play dumb on Kenneth's question. My my uh, my assistant theory just came up with an answer for you. Uh, a free field microphone is designed essentially to measure the sound pressure as it was before the microphone was introduced into the sound field. Okay. A pressure microphone is for measuring the actual sound pressure on the surface of the microphone's diaphragm. And the random incidence microphone is for measuring in sound fields where the sound comes from many different directions. Okay. What was the third one? That, uh, I just, I see uh, free field, diffuse field, and pressure field. And then it- Oh, random incidence is diffuse field. Okay. So it sounds like it's more of a measurement topic than an actual- all of, yeah, all these have to do with uh, measurement, microphones, free field, pressure, random incidents. And I'll put the link in your answer to the question here. Okay, good. As opposed to a live sound or a studio application. Right. Okay. Gotta love Siri. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right. Moving, I can move on. You guys yeah, call. Yeah, we got a few more minutes, and okay, you know, I put some more money in the meter, Ken. So I think we're okay. Um, Excellent. So uh, let's uh, keep moving forward. And I don't need to hit the I don't need to hit the bladder break for another two hours. So, um, two mics on acoustic guitar. This is probably my go-to technique. Um, and again, it depends on I listen to the guitar player and I hear what it sounds like, and then I position. XY miking on a guitar will add size to that to give me a more spread feel, especially if I'm trying to do a stereo thing. The other two techniques are I'm looking at the guitar as a mono source and a mix. Um, orchestral, again, single mics. Now we're doing like a live thing. Uh, multiple violins, small diaphragms, locate one or two feet above and above the players. Typically, I'll put one microphone between two players. Uh, AT used to make, I think we still have it in the product line because I bought a ton of these things. They're called a Unimix. It's a little um, uh, phantom powered mixer that'll take two inputs to a single output, a little black box, the size of a direct box. And I'll use those in a large situation where I've got a lot of string players and, and blend those two string players to save inputs on the console. It gains me more mixer channels. We've also do a mic mount that'll allow us to mount the uh, ATM 350, which is the little clip-on microphone. There's a Velcro mount for a, um, a violin that mounts right below the bridge between the bridge and the tailpiece. I've also taken a BP-892 or BP-893 head-worn microphone and put it on the player on the uh, side, the, 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 I get my left and right mixed up, on the proper side to pick up as what the player hears. And that way, if the player is moving around playing violin, I can uh, the mic is still in the same same plane. So a head worn microphone on the player as well. Um, uh, cello and bass, upright bass. The F holes on either side of the strings. I use a clip on microphone about six inches from the F hole to get a pretty decent balance of the key tones of the thing. If I move it closer to the F hole, I get more low frequency. If I move it closer to the bridge, I'll get a little bit more treble or a little bit more top end of the bass. I've also taken a 4050 studio microphone, one of the, the side address, 
wrapped it in foam and put it between the tailpiece and the body of the upright bass and got a really interesting upright bass sound with that technique in a studio. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then this is this technique here. So it's between the tailpiece and the instrument body. And it gets a real rich, warm, a little bit woody at times. But it also um, gave me a real nice, full, rich, low tone. Single mic ensemble for live or recording, the traditional bluegrass arrangement. Bluegrass players with a 4047 or a good large diaphragm side address condenser microphone position the players around the mic. They will position themselves based on how they want to balance, and then they'll step in close for solos. That's the classic Grand Old Opry technique. Used to use RCA 77s back in the day. Uh, Mike should be about chin height to the average player, about 12 to 18 inches away from the performers. Um, I may or may not have to raise the mic to balance um, between instruments and vocals if they're singing and playing at the same time. Um, and it's just a nice uh, ensemble technique for the bluegrass players. Uh, DIs versus internal pickups. We talked about passive DIs and active DIs a little bit. Um, the traditional DI is a transformer coupled box. And of course, the, the more expensive the DI, the better quality iron, the better quality transformer you're gonna get in the DI. Um, DI versus miking an amplifier speaker and a guitar amp. The DI advantages will be cleaner sound, more high and low frequencies, gives you a little bit more control. There's no leakage, obviously, because it's a DI. And if the guy's going direct off his acoustic guitar, I don't even need the amplifier. A lot of players say they don't get, they want the tone of the guitar amp in their sound. Um, and because there are transformer devices, it adds another signal device, electronic device in the signal chain. Some players say going through a DI versus miking their amp sounds more too present. Putting an amp on or a mic on an amplifier speaker is going to help get interaction of room acoustics as well as the picking up of the sound of the instrument coming from the amp. More mid bass for more punch, depending on where the mic is positioned on that speaker. Creates potential for different sound textures as I move the microphone around. Uh, allows the player to control his tone because oftentimes the guitar player wants the tone of the amp and the speaker. And of course, other players can hear the guitar amp in the space. The disadvantages, I've, obviously my sound can leak into the other microphones on stage. Uh, a lot of guitar amps are really noisy, a lot of buzzes and things. So I'm gonna pick those noises up. Uh, other musicians may say the guitar player is way too loud and I may get distortion. <clears throat> uh, that aren't ideal. I'll read a question here. Recording in the studio, Mike, is a mic placement a good way to combat acoustics in a room that aren't ideal? Absolutely. Microphone placement in the studio, even moving a microphone a couple of inches can make all the difference on capturing something. Um, or will mic tend to pick up a cancel frequency, especially low frequency from room modes, regardless of where it's placed? Um, again, moving a microphone, this goes back to the traditional ways that they recorded before we got into large consoles and close miking techniques is the engineer would literally listen to what the ensemble sounded like and moving a microphone a couple of inches can make all the difference in the world as far as what it's picking up and uh, and and other uh, reflections off of walls and things in the space. Uh, I, I totally agree with Jeff on that. It's uh, place mic placement is key. And the best way to is to use my ears and listen before I start setting mics up. Interesting thing on multi-speaker guitar cabinets. There's a lot of guitar players that'll take their, you know, their four speaker Marshall cabinet and they'll remove all the speakers except for one. And they'll replace the, the all the speakers with one that's like their vintage uh, a Celestian or one that sounds the best. And the rest of the holes in the cabinet will be covered with plywood. So what I typically do is uh, have the player play, listen for a sweet spot, and I take a flashlight and I shine the flashlight into all the speaker openings just to make certain that there's a speaker behind those holes in the grill. Dynamic mics are going to handle higher SPLs of that guitar amp. Condenser microphones will provide a subtler or warmer sound because their low frequency response is a little bit better, provided they can handle the SPLs. And if you've got a condenser mic with a pad switch in it, you can engage that pad switch. 
The new thing is ribbon microphones on guitar amps. So we make a pencil ribbon or a, a it's a side address pencil ribbon microphone. Royer makes a pencil ribbon microphone. Um, they like the inherent warmth of the ribbon microphone. And because the new ribbon microphones are much more rugged, we're seeing those on live stages as well in the studios on uh, guitar amps. A lot of times they'll put the guitar amp speaker in an enclosure with a ribbon mic inside of it because they want to try and keep the stage volume down. Um, cardioid um, microphones will uh, minimize leakage on stage, but you have the proximity effect to deal with. I have seen some guys use an omnidirectional microphone because we're taking the inverse square law to our advantage because we're very close to a loud sound source. I don't have as much leakage because I don't have the, the mic up as high and I don't have the proximity effect. Same thing with the ribbon. Uh, um, I don't get the proximity effect on the ribbon. Of course, we saw this earlier. I don't think that's going to work unless I want to pick up the hum. Uh, again, this is a three-dimensional picture on a two-dimensional slide. So if the kind of lighter purple thing is my loudspeaker and the microphones are pointing at the speaker. If I move the microphone more off center of the speaker, I'm going to get a more mellow or dull sound depending on the mic and the acoustics, but I'll also reduce the amount of amp noise picked up. One of the things on a guitar amp speaker is something called a wizard cone in the middle. The wizard cone picks up some of that uh, or, or, ample, or reinforces some of that mid to high frequency uh, sound of that guitar, but it also reinforces the buzzes and noises of the amplifier as well. So one inch from the center of the speaker, I'm going to get a bassier sound, proximity effect on the mic, but it's going to minimize onstage leaking. Four inches from the amp, uh, center of the speaker is going to give me a more natural sound. As I move the microphone further from the center of the speaker, I'm going to get a thinner sound, but more leakage in the room. Obviously, on a live stage, I wouldn't put the, uh, put the uh, microphone 36 inches away from the amplifier speaker. Uh, we don't make one of these, but I have some Sennheiser side address dynamic mics that are designed for guitar amps that are tailored for guitar amps. Uh, that I can hang over the guitar amp and minimize mic stands on a live stage. I've, I've got a couple of those that I use quite a bit when I do some small festival things in the summer. The little AE2300 that's on the slide is kind of a unique microphone. It's a large diaphragm dynamic microphone designed specifically for guitar amps. And what we did with that microphone, as opposed to a lot of other um, microphones, is it has a high pass filter a high pass filter as opposed to a um, a, a low, uh, a, and with a high pass filter, or I'm sorry, it has a high cut filter as opposed to a low cut filter. So it passes the low frequencies as opposed to the low cut filter allowing the high frequencies to pass, if that makes any sense at all. Engaging that high cut filter rolls off the top end of the microphone from about 8K on, which allows me to still get the tone of the guitar amp, but minimizes the pickup of all the little buzzes and things. So it has a high cut filter or a low pass filter as opposed to a low cut high pass filter that you'll see on most microphones. If I haven't confused you now, I've probably totally confused you now. Uh, and that's the 2300. It was designed for miking guitar amplifiers specifically. <clears throat> Bass amplifier, uh, I typically run it through a DI. Um, once in a while, I'll get a guy that wants to put a microphone on it. I'll look at a large diaphragm condenser to get the low frequencies, or I'll look at a microphone designed for a kick drum. And our BP40 broadcast voiceover mic is an excellent choice for that because although we market it as a voiceover mic, it's an amazing mic in a kick drum. It's an amazing microphone on Barry Sachs, and it's a good mic on a... Uh, um, on a uh, bass guitar amplifier. Um, so again, a lot of the microphone choices are personal preference based on what the what you think sounds right for the application you're doing. These are all just kind of guidelines in choices. Uh, grand piano, lid fully open, primarily studio situation. Um, two microphones, 12 inches above the strings, six to eight inches forward of the hammers, uh, nice wide expansive sound with minimal ambiance. Three to one spacing rule. If I place the mics closer to the hammers, I'm going to get more attack. Sometimes I'll put a single microphone over the sweet spot. I'll listen with one ear covered to find that sweet spot on the piano. Um, oh, Mac is on. 
Yeah, just we're going to ask Steve, could you go ahead and just uh, explain for everyone the three to one rule? Yes, the three to one rule says the distance between a microphone and the sound source, if that's three inches, the distance between two mics should be three times three or nine inches minimum. And that's going to minimize phase cancellation effects between the two microphones. Classic example of that happening is in a kick drum. A lot of guys will put a plate mic inside a kick drum because they want to get the tone of the drum shell. And then they'll put a dynamic mic in the kick drum to uh, pick up the thwack of the beater against the drum head. And what happens is because there's like weird spacing between those two microphones, I may get some phase issues where I, I get frequencies to cancel out. Um, a plate mic, by the way, is what some people call a PZM. And a PZM is actually a pressure zone microphone where I've got a boundary surface that's made by was made by Crown. I think it's still made by, marketed by Crown. So I've got a boundary flat surface and this little microphone capsule is just above the surface pointing at the surface. It needs a fairly large boundary to be effective at low frequencies. And, and when it first came out, it was a go-to microphone over choirs on these big plexiglass plates. A boundary microphone, if everybody, I'm really dating myself, remembers the old Electro Voice mic mouse, which is a foam piece that allows you to lay a microphone on a stage floor. So you'd lay this microphone flat on the stage floor and it would use the stage as a boundary surface, as a reflective boundary surface to pick up actors on a stage as opposed to putting the microphone on a mic stand above the stage. So I'd see this in high school theaters all the time. There'd be a row of SM58s across the front of the stage on mic booms, you know, aimed up at the, at the actors' voices. And they wondered why they were getting all kinds of feedback. I would take those same microphones and lay them on foam pieces on the bound, on the stage floor itself. And the foam min helped minimize pickup of the foot noise. And all of a sudden, I could get more gain before feedback because I was using that stage as a reflective boundary surface. The other problem with putting microphones on tabletop stands where I've got a person sitting at a table talking as opposed to a boundary mic, say, in a conference situation, is I get reflections off the tabletop that hit the microphone slightly later, I get face cancellation issues. Right. So yeah, it's, the, all, the boundary, it's all phase. The boundary mic worked because the distance between the reflecting surface and the direct sound Cancel. was so small that it did exactly. not have that did not have that cancellation. And that's also how the PZM works. Correct. It, at the PZM, it, the mic comes down at the surface with a real small pressure zone. And you need a fairly large plexiglass plate if you're going to suspend one of those things to get it uh, um, to get it on uh, uh, to get it uh, to get the low frequency response to really come right. Through. And they were sometimes used as foot mics as well with a with a yes. barrier behind them. And yes. then Crown came out, modified it, and made the PCC 160. PCC 160 is an amazing microphone. I have and two then, of those uh, at the Symphony then, Hall. Uh, then he went off and formed his own company and mm -hmm. and uh, made a new version of it yeah the pc i've got some pc one pcc 160s at the symphony hall that belong to the symphony and i'd love to put them in my mic case when i leave at the end of a gig but because <laughs> they are they are they're really nice plate mics we make a whole series of plate mics our favorite one which we've down we've made it smaller uh was the uh um atm oh geez the number just slipped my mind but it was it looked like a uh Looked like a little spaceship, uh, like some kind of a Star Wars space warrior. Um, and it was just a big flat plate mic that you could lay in a kick drum and get a really nice tonality of the kick drum sound. Um, check on the questions here real quick. Um, yeah, you you could intentionally violate the three to one rule to enhance the source or cancel unwanted overtones in drums. I mean, you know, the three to one rule is not a golden rule. It is a good guideline rule, but you know, and a lot of these rules are meant to be broken. Some of the laws of physics, though, you can't break, unfortunately. Um, is there a difference between using a filter on a microphone or using it in post? Um, all things equal from Jeff Simmons. The roll-off filter in the microphone, um, again, in a live sound situation, I'm going to use that. In a recording situation, I would probably use the filters in post to give me more control. Um, the main reason of engaging that low pass filter or low cut filter and 
is to basically minimize uh, mechanical noise, especially on vocals, um, if I'm using a condenser microphone and uh, other uh, strings and things where I want to minimize the pickup of mechanical noise. I could do that if I wanted to put a filter on each channel and post. Sometimes it's easier just to flip the switch on the microphone in the actual session. Um, let's see, PC-160 is used a lot for effects mics and sporting events. Hockey, yes. Uh, RAT-891s are also used as plate mics in the winter games on the on the glass on hockey games, and they look like a kind of like a spaceship-looking thing. I should have brought one out. But the, the nice thing about the boundary mic is using that reflective surface. I actually gaffer taped a uh, uh, 891 plate mic to a drummer once just to see what it would do and got a real interesting, from his perspective, uh, sound uh, gap taping a mic to a drummer uh, doing some interesting weird things. Uh, grand piano, if I um, partially open or short stick, two microphones, six inches above the strings, six to eight inches forward of the hammers, three to one spacing roll again. Sound might be muddy because now I'm getting more reflections off the lid. Uh, I'll use some channel EQ or low cut filter to roll off the bass, and I'll use some channel EQ to maybe boost the highs ever so slightly to get a little bit more natural sound. Um, I've also taken in, in, a, in a grand piano and taped a plate mic either on the underside of the lid, if they'll let me do that. The Steinway folks aren't really keen on me gaff taping anything to the underside of the lid of their nine foot Steinway. Um, or I'll put a gaffer's tape bridge across the frame um, and lay the microphone on top of the gaffer's tape bridge um, and, and float the mic that way. So a gaffer's tape bridge is another way. We also came out with uh, magnetic mounts for our ATM 350s, which allow me to stick the microphones to the piano frame, and the little goosenecks allow me to position these microphones appropriately underneath the piano in a, in a short stick or um, a partially open lid situation. I did this trick once. I was doing a church sound seminar, and the church, for some reason, didn't buy enough mic stands, and I didn't know we had a grand piano to mic. And I used, I had two of these AE2500 dual element kick drum mics. And I took one of them and used it in the kick drum. It worked great. The second one, I opened the mic up to see where the two capsules were. And there's two time and phase aligned capsules in this guy. And I basically positioned the microphone so that the dynamic capsule was oriented towards the low string side of the piano. And the little condenser capsule was oriented towards the high string side of the piano. Put it about middle C. Uh, you can see in the little diagram, uh, facing towards the tail end of the piano, just in front of the hammers, and got uh, uh, the piano was on short stick and got a really nice minimal EQ required piano sound using this one microphone, one mic stand technique. So it's kind of a cool, uh, again, you know, fun with microphones experimentation type thing. If I've got to close the lid of the piano, um, boundary mic mounted to a closed lid at the keyboard edge. If I can tape the mic to the to the uh, lid of the piano, if not, I'll mount the mic on a gaffer's tape bridge to the piano frame using real gaffer's tape. Um, sometimes I'll mount a single mic where the piano frame curves at that apex of its curved wall. I'll mount a boundary mic that way uh, inside the piano. Again, if I can tape the mic inside the piano using gaffer's tape. I've had some people say, well, why not just place the microphone underneath the piano? The sound gets really boomy and really woody because you're getting all the soundboard uh, compared to other mic placement techniques on a grand piano. Uh, there's also a piano mic uh, pickup unit that's made by, I think it's Earthworks. It's little gooseneck mics on a bar that goes across the uh, piano frame, which is another choice. And then our ATM 350s with their uh, magnetic mounts are a real nice, uh, nice way to get mics inside a grand piano. Uh, upright piano, I did some uh, honky-tonk bands where they peeled off the front of the piano below the uh, keyboard and above the pedals, and I put uh, my piano mics there, uh, which was kind of nice. I really got a real nice honky-tonk piano sound that way, but most upright piano players won't do that to their piano. So one mic six inches over the open lid placed above the treble strings will give me a nice sound, but obviously it's going to lack some bass because I'm far away from the low end strings. It will pick up hammer attack. Um, it's a good placement for a single microphone. 
If I can, adding a second mic will give me a little bit more fuller sound on it. Um, if they piano, they won't let me open the lid of the piano. Now I'll aim the mics at the soundboard. I won't get the hammer attack. It's going to get a little tubby or a little woody because I'm coming off the back side of the of the soundboard. Um, and the soundboard should be facing into the room and not against a wall in this case. Um, it'll be a little thin on the trebly side because of the soundboard. So my first choice is to go above the piano if I can get the lid open or keep the, take the lid off. Um, if they want the lid closed and I can tape a boundary mic to the inside of the closed piano lid, uh, again, I experiment with the placement of the mic between to balance between low and high strings. I've done that in a situation where I've had to close the lid. Leslie speakers, two rotating drivers reproduce that whirling tremolo effect requires two microphones to get the maximum effect. The interesting thing about the Leslie speaker is the top rotator the sound only comes out of one side of that horn. The uh, second side is plugged and it's just a counterbalance to keep the thing from moving around. Um, so it takes two microphones on the Leslie speaker and I'm typically on the top I'll use a small diaphragm condenser and on the bottom I'll use a, di a, lar a, a dynamic or a large diaphragm condenser. And if I can get a clip, if the back of the Leslie's open like this one is, I'll use a clamp mount and mount it right to the frame of the thing. Live sound, saxophone. Um, we make a clip-on mic called the ATM350. Sure makes a similar type product. Uh, DPA makes a similar type clip-on microphone. Um, it's basically a small diaphragm condenser on a little gooseneck thing. We redesigned this product uh, a couple of years ago to allow it to lock to the bell of the horn. In this case, uh, Mindy's using a uh, body pack transmitter mounted to the side of the horn with the mic mounted to it. Um, the uh, nice thing about this is I can position the microphone so I get sound coming out of the bell. I can also aim it to also get some of the sound coming out of the valve holes. Um, it's going to be a, a if it's uh, aimed into the bell, it's going to be a brighter sound. If it's aimed a little bit toward the edge of the bell, it's going to give me um, a little bit of the mix of the sound coming out of the valve holes as well as the sound coming out of the out of the horn's bell. That's probably a go-to live sound. Uh, horn thing. I do big band jazz a lot in the summertime, and I actually put these mics on all the players, even though I'm ensemble miking the band, and then I just mute them, and then when the, the player stands up to do his solo, I then bring his mic in a little bit, so I do that, um, just to give me a little bit more control over the saxes. Um, again, in the studio, I've done a ribbon mic situation, and I start to get a little bit further away to get a blend between the finger hole sound and the sound coming out of the bell. Ribbon gives me a little bit warmer saxophone sound. Condenser is going to give me a little bit brighter saxophone sound in the studio. And of course, this is not how to mic a saxophone. Uh, any type of brass instruments, the key to a brass instrument is uh, if I'm more direct on the bass, I'm going to get a brighter, more punchy sound. As I start to move off axis of the bell, that horn, it's going to get me a little bit more mellow sound. And again, in a live sound situation, I'll use the clip-on mics on the horn players. If I'm doing a big band thing, I'll do ensemble miking, and I'll do a condenser mic between a pair of horn players. And then when they solo, they'll just step into the microphone uh, and let them blend as one. Uh, same thing with any type of trumpets, trombone, cornet in the studio. I'll do the same thing. I'll start to move the instrument away from the horn. The more on axis I get, the brighter the sound is. The more off axis I get of that horn's bell, the more mellower sound I'm going to get. And then sometimes I'll do a clip on mic if I need to isolate and I want a brighter sound on the horn. Um, French horn's an interesting beast because the sound, the player holds the horn, they stuff their hand in the bell, and the sound comes out the back. Uh, in the symphony, my French horn players are playing in front of a reflective surface, so I'm picking them up with the ensemble mics. I do brass bands in the summertime where I'm miking the French horns, and what I'm doing is I'm, because there's no reflective surface behind them, I'm miking a uh, shared mic between two French horn players, and I'm just kind of adding that as a fill mic to the ensemble mics in, in, the, in the brass band. The tough thing about a brass band is I've got 40 horns of front bell brass blowing toward the front, 
and they're surrounded in the backside by all the loud percussion in a normal situation. In this situation, all the percussion stuff gets mic'd because the front bell brass playing in front of those guys literally drowns all that stuff out. In the studio, the same thing. If I've got a soft reflective surface, I'm gonna use a studio mic, a uh, large diaphragm condenser. Uh, if I've got a reflective surface behind French horn players, I'm gonna use that reflective surface to my advantage to help even out the sound between multiple players. Uh, again, I do brass band stuff, so I've got a little bit more on this brass band. Tubas, euphoniums, I like a large diaphragm condenser because I want the low frequency response. I want a little bit more detail. Uh, placing the mic slightly off axis of the bell is going to minimize some of that blattiness on tubas and euphoniums. Uh, I think a condenser mic over a dynamic will have a little bit better low frequency response, a little bit smoother low frequency response on these type of instruments in the brass band world. Now, same thing in the studio. Um, again, if I'm doing any kind of uh, orchestral thing, it's going to be more ensemble miking with uh, a decatry or uh, um, uh, decatry and outriggers and RTF pair for my wins, and then maybe a spot mic or two if I've got solo players. Uh, acoustic drums. How many mics do I need on this thing? Well, believe it or not, in a studio situation, if the mic is positioned right, you can get an amazing drum sound with one or two microphones. And that's because I like to try and treat the drum set as an ensemble and blend all of its parts and not have to mic every drum. Again, before a session, make sure the drums are in tune and all the parts are there. I actually did two live gigs where the drummer forgot his kick drum. Don't ask me why, but he did. Had to run back home. Um, Kick drum microphone. The typical go-to kick drum mic is a large diaphragm dynamic microphone. Positioned properly, I want a balance of beater, head, and shell resonance. Beater meaning the beater attack on the uh, the beater against the beater head. Um, the shell resonance is the tone of the drum. Single mic through a hole in the front head of the drum, which is the standard way. <clears throat> I kind of try and listen for the sweet spot. The more I get the closer I get the mic to the drum head, the more beater I'm going to get. The closer to the center of the drum head, the more low frequency I'm going to get. The closer to the sides, the more harmonic overtones of that bass drum I'm going to get. If I've got a drummer that doesn't want, uh, doesn't have a hole cut in his head, and I've got some jazz players that uh, don't want to cut a hole in their drum head, or they've got drum heads with some band logo on it, they don't want to cut a hole and ruin the band logo. Then I just have to listen to the uh, listen to the guy play the drum and find the sweet spot and place the mic close to it. A lot of times guys will put a second mic in the kick drum to get more shell tone. And this is the classic choice where I put a condenser plate mic in the bottom of the drum to capture the roundness of the drum tone. And I put a big dynamic to capture the beater attack. Classic drum miking setup. The problem with this is the potential phase issues if the, this be based on the spacing of those two microphones. And our choice was this uh, single element or dual element single mic kick drum mic, which is the AE2500. And I've got two elements. I've got a dynamic element and a condenser element in this microphone, and they are time and phase aligned. So I have minimal phase cancellation effects. Single cable. Uh, five pin XLR, it fans out to two three pin XLR connectors. So I use two channels on my mixer or two preamps, use a single mic stand, single cable, easier to set up, less hassle. Closer to the beater head for more beater punch, moving it slightly off center gives me more of the roundness of the shell. I've also used this on bass guitar amps. I've also used this in pianos. I've used this on floor toms. I've used this on all a whole bunch of different sources. The downside is, is every one of these mics requires two input channels. But you know, in the days of 56, con 56 channel consoles, it's probably not as much of an issue. Um, rack toms, floor tom, they are the melody of the drum set. Uh, rack tom, dynamic mic, half inch inside the rim, kind of close to the top head. One of the nice things about uh, the AT um, Tom mic, as opposed to uh, one of the competitors, is we have an all-metal housing. So if the drummer whacks this thing with a drumstick, he's not going to damage it. Uh, I've got I've seen some of the ones that are nice, lightweight, and they're plastic. Um, and um, 
uh, I've seen that situation where you whack it and uh, the uh, uh, it, ju it just really just shatters the thing. Uh, Wayne Pierce, I've used a wireless lav taped to the underside of the lid in a pinch. That's a good idea if they have to move the piano and you don't want to deal with cables. That's a great idea. We also make a wireless boundary mic that is uh, terminated to fit our wireless systems and can be terminated to fit other wireless systems and what it does is it takes the bias from the uh, body packs uh, by condenser bias voltage to, uh, to mic something that's got to move. I had a guy one time wanted to put wireless microphones on his drum set and I said why and he said because we roll the drum set in and we roll the drum set out during the performance several times and we didn't want to deal with an umbilical cord. So we actually used a wireless system that we made several years ago that we don't no longer made. And we uh, put wireless mics on this uh, drum set. It was kind of bizarre, but interesting nonetheless. Um, floor tom, large diaphragm, either dynamic or condenser. I've sometimes used a large diaphragm condenser on floor toms because it gives me a little bit more tone of the drum. Uh, I've used a large diaphragm, our AE3000 is a large diaphragm condenser that will handle some pretty high transients and some pretty high SPL. It's not as hot as a lot of condensers on the output because it'll handle those higher SPLs. And then the ATM350 clip-on, we have a drum mount for this thing, which is really an interesting mount because it clips over a, a lug, it attaches to the lug, but as you can see in the little photo, you can still get your tuning key on the lug, so the tuning function of the lug still comes into play. So it's a pretty cool uh, microphone for that. And again, the condenser is going to give me the tonality and I can position it with the little goosenecks. Um, so the snare drum. Snare drum is a tom with higher pitch and less sustain. And then you've got the snare wires on the bottom that are going to give you its crispness and its high frequency cut. Um, then uh, the snare can be the hardest thing to mic because a lot of players like a real bright, crispy snare sound if you mic it too close, it's going to be lifeless. If you mic it too far away, you're going to get too many overtones. Um, wood snare drums are going to give you more warmth sounding than metal ones. Metal ones are going to be brighter. Piccolo snare is going to be a lot brighter. Um, I like a mic that's got a presence peak because it's going to give me more bite. My go-to choice is either the ATM350 clip-on or our 650 um, uh, dynamic um, instrument microphone because it's going to give me a little bit harder snare edge. Uh, the, the 350 clip-on mic, if it's a jazz player, will give me a little bit more Christmas, especially if they're playing with brushes and things. Um, Jeff says, would you want to use condensers or ribbons on drums as opposed to dynamics for quicker transient response? For my cymbals and hi-hats, yes. For my toms and my kick drum and even my snare, I'm going for, because I'm dealing with high SPLs and I may overload most condensers. I have used in a jazz player the, the clip-on mics. I'll talk about overheads in just a moment. Uh, the cool thing about the ATM650, this is similar to the classic snare drum mic, which is the SM57. The SM57 has two things that I personally don't like. One, it's got a plastic uh, um, head case mount, which if the drummer whacks it good and hard because it's always in the wrong spot, it's gonna shatter. The other thing is it's a cardioid, so positioning it in the optimal place to keep it out of the drummer's way puts the hi-hat symbol out of its null point. Our ATM650 is a hypercardioid, so putting it in the optimal place on the snare to keep it out of the drummer's way puts the hi-hat in the null point, which is 60 degrees off axis from the, uh, from the mic. So I use the angles to minimize hi-hat bleed in that microphone, and it still keeps the mic out of the drummer's way. There's a company that modifies an SM57 by making it a right angle microphone to allow it to be easier to position on a drum set. And that's kind of a cool cho uh, choice as well. I've also used the AE3000 condenser on a snare because it'll handle a higher SPL transients and give me a little bit brighter snare sound. And then if it's a jazz player that's not really pounding the snare hard, I'll use the ATM350 and the drum mount. Adding the second microphone be be uh, below the snare, and that's usually a small diaphragm condenser with a pad in, will help give me the snare buzz and some of the snappiness of the snares. I reverse the polarity on that microphone to maintain my phase relationship issues on the drum set in, the, uh, in this case. So the two diaphragms are working together like this instead of opposing each other. Uh, Hi-hat. Hi-hat produces two sounds, the clap and the shimmer. 
and its frequencies are going to cut through all the other drum sounds. It's the timekeeper in a drum set. Both sounds are important, so I want to get a balance between the high high stick attack on that thing and the shimmer of the hi-hat. The big problem I have to watch out is when those two cymbals come together, you get this big chuff of air as the cymbals come together. So what I typically do is I'll use our ATM450, which is a pencil side address small diaphragm condenser microphone that I will put slightly at an angle on the hi-hat above the hi-hat so I don't get the chuff of air coming out. The closer I put it to the top of the hi-hat, the more the bell tone I'm going to get off the bell of the uh, of the of the cymbal. The further away I get it, um, the more I'm going to get a little bit more balanced sound and less of a bell sound. But I've got to be really careful that I don't get too close to the edge and I get the chuff of sound when the hi-hat closes. Um, I also mount the locate that microphone in such a way to minimize um, snare bleed uh, with the positioning of that of the hi-hat mic. Sometimes I'll share a microphone with hi-hat and snare. Again, I'll take, because I'm in a quick mic situation, maybe it's a small festival where I don't have time to mic up all the drums, and I will do a real simple kick snare overhead setup, and, uh, and I'll just take and position my snare mic to get a little blend between hi-hat and snare. A lot of guys think the drum overheads are picking up the cymbals. In reality, the drum overheads are picking up the entire drum set. Um, and I'm looking at... Um, I need to try to get that balance of that drum set as an ensemble. So oftentimes I'll use a single hi-hat or a single drum overhead microphone if it's a small drum kit. As I get into a larger drum set, I'll use two um, uh, drum overhead microphones. And the positioning of those microphones is to find a center spot. And typically I'll use the center of the snare and I'll use a tape measure to try and maintain equal distance to keep my phase, uh, uh, my phase issues, uh, minimize my phase issues. And I'll use the three to one rule, meaning the microphones are three times apart as they are from the center of the snare drum. I want to try and balance the entire drum set with that over with those overhead mics, uh, snares, toms, and the cymbals. So my basic down and dirty drum miking setup is a kick drum mic, a snare drum mic, and then an overhead microphone. So I do a kick snare overhead in probably 90% of the gigs, unless it's a big stage festival or some you know fairly big bigger tour act where I need to mic toms or I need to mic um, all the drums. I'm going to go do a kick snare overhead thing. Sometimes I'll replace the overhead mic if it's a rock act with uh, a pair of mics, uh, a clip-on mic on the two rack toms shared and a floor tom mic and let those mics pick the balance up on the uh, cymbals. If it's, a, again, trying to do quick and easy uh, festival where I've got five acts in an afternoon on a small community stage. I am a percussionist, so I do play uh, congas and things. Uh, in these instruments, I'm primarily looking from the tone. So I'm gonna use a clip-on mic, uh, or if I'm in a studio, I'll go a condenser mic one to three feet from the instrument. If he's playing multiples, let them blend. If I'm in a live situation, I'll use a clip-on microphone. Um, sometimes I will use the 230 dynamic microphones if I'm doing timbales. Uh, sometimes I'll use our AE3000 or even the 4040, which is the side address guy, even in a live situation, if it's a guy that's really doing some subtle playing or he's really kind of, kind of you know, feathering his playing versus just a guy pounding on these guys. Uh, Steel drums, I do a steel drum thing, and I mic the steel drums from underneath with the clip-on condensers. On the, We have a long gooseneck for them. And the other case I've used to mic pans, uh, a Mikey's mic clip and the uh, a large diaphragm condenser vocal mic if I want to get more low frequency on the steel drums. Uh, the Cajon. Interesting, there's a lot of guys doing this now in their acoustic sets. I'm looking for a wood tone and a sizzle. Uh, condenser boundary mic inside the cajon will give me a blend of both sounds. I may have to EQ the low end a little bit. Uh, sometimes I'll put a dynamic mic, like a ATM250 kick drum mic, offset from the sound hole on the rear of the box, and then add a small diaphragm condenser in front of the box to get some of the attack and the snare sounds. Um, it can add a dynamic mic at the box for more depth on the cajon. Uh, again, any of the these are all fun things to play. I'm looking for a balance of the slap, the closed tone, and the bass tone from the bottom. Typically, I'll just mic these with a condenser microphone about two inches above the drum head if I've got a player playing these guys. Um, 
AE5100 is a real interesting mic. It was originally designed as an instrument mic. It's a large diaphragm pencil condenser with a one inch diaphragm in a fairly small microphone housing. It makes a fantastic choir microphone um, as well as a good mic for um, these kind of more low frequency um, instruments like uh, some of these uh, acoustic drum things. So that's just kind of a little wind up. The last piece, I did a whole series of uh, the uh, Blue Devils uh, ensemble miking for Drum and Bugle Corps, uh, the Conqueror Blue Devils. I did their miking package uh, for a number of years. And we had to roll on all of these uh, ensemble pieces, all these marimbas, all these xylophones. And I came up with a miking technique where I placed um, two small diaphragm condensers. And I used a real inexpensive condensers between the resonators about 12 inches below the bars. And I used a Unimix combiner so each instrument was a single mic cord coming out. And the way it worked is the players rolled their instrument out. They hauled their mic cord and they went and they plugged it into their number on a stage snake that was on the drummer's platform. And they had to do this in like five minutes, like three minutes before their halftime show started in ensemble competition. And that was easier than trying to mic from above and trying to mic the bars from above. And it worked out really, really well for these guys. And they had, obviously the carts they had had giant all-terrain wheels on them. And these kids would run these things out, uncoil their mic cable, plug into the snake box. And they had this thing up and running in like three minutes before the, the group performed. So I can talk about our microphones for a few minutes, or I can go on. You guys call. You guys are I, driving the bus. I, I think we got another show starting in 20 minutes, so we got to start <laughs> doing that. Bye. Bye. I, I have to all make, the time. I can go all day long, and another show starting, got to kick me out. I have to and, make two comments. Exactly. Okay. So, number one, your suggestion that there is such a thing as a subtle timbali player had me roll in the aisles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and on uh, your micing up your big marimbas on uh, on the Broadway show Blast, which was a 60 piece marching band with uh, with the whole flag corps, uh, we mic'd them up with wireless on the insides of their wrists. Oh, OK. They would just I mean, the thing ran around the stage uh, mm -hmm. six and a half octave marimba. I mean, literally running around the stage with the Boy, player flying. chasing it. Oh, wow. Um, That's cool. It worked great. And all of the, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of players wearing like a uh, marching Tom's rig with like four, mm -hmm. four or five drums on it. And yep. that was uh, lobs, wireless lobs on their chests. and On their chests. Well, the, on, the ensemble, when you're in DCI competition for drum and bugle course, what happens is it's like a halftime show at a football game. So each group yeah. has a set amount of time, I'll say seven minutes. And in seven minutes, they've got to roll their, on, they've got to roll their ensemble out. They've got to connect their sound system and they've got to be ready to go. And then when they're, they're in, still within their time, they've got to end their performance and pack this all up. So we designed a, I designed a cabling system to string these things together and the players would literally plug into the snake box that was on the drum platform and then that went by a cat five back to the sound mixer that was up in the stand someplace and it was uh it was pretty pretty cool to watch these guys do that it was just amazing what these guys were doing yeah my so. nephews went through high school doing that and now one of them one of them just graduated from uconn where he played in the band all the way through and the other one is i think a senior at temple now Excellent, excellent. Still playing in the Temple Band. Well, I think I signed up for that three o'clock webinar, so I'm, I'll be able to grab a 15-minute <laughs> lunch before I sit in on one. Well, Peter, it's actually 4 p.m. Eastern, so you oh, got time. Oh, Steve. I got some. I got a good. Uh, Pete, Mac, and Kelly, thank you so much for having me. I hope this was entertaining as well as educational for everybody out there. Um, it, it was. It was great. And you tied the record. Absolutely loved your lawyer uh, reading of uh, the uh, inverse square rule. <laughs> <laughs> the closer there you are, you the louder it gets. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So to all, to all, all, I don't know how many attendees there were, but to all the attendees, um, thank you very much for listening. And, and hopefully I answered the questions and I learned some things as well on measurement mics. That, uh, um, yeah, thank you.
Now, little, uh, we can all go out to the lobby and there's a, a lab session set up with all these drums and all these mics. <laughs> yes, normally when, I, normally when I do this, the lecture is about 40 minutes long. And then um, I take the students into the studio and we actually do a mic up lab that's that's a blast and and demonstrations. So um, you guys got the lecture part with the descriptor part of the demonstrations, and hopefully we got something. Everybody got something out of it. So yeah, it was I would really terrific. Everybody... Thank you very much, Steve. All right. Exactly. Thank yeah, you and, very uh, much. Yeah. So everybody who's still on, uh, a couple things. Electro coming up at 4 p.m. Eastern. Still room in the uh, in the lecture hall for Mr. Carl Winkler which is always an engaging uh, conversation. Um, we've got two new things we're trying this week. Um, first, Tuesday night, we're doing a thing for the Australian time zone, number one. Well, that's not really new. The new thing is that our presenter, um, Al Craig, is a broadcast A2 who basically wrote a field guide for his fellow A2s for implementing Sennheiser WSM. Uh, broadcast A2s obviously have a very short time frame to get everything set, not just wireless and RF coordinated and everything else. They have a lot to do. So uh, it's interesting. He's he's created a workflow to uh, speed that along. So I would suggest, um, number one, that you sign up for that. But number two, if you're out there and you've kind of developed a program for the folks in, in the, uh, the shop that you uh, worked in prior to getting uh, an early spring break, um, or if you had um, kind of your own workflow that you put together, reach out to us at the emails below. Let's talk about whether that's something that might be able to uh, turn into a, uh, a webinar to, to share your experiences with others. And then um, on Wednesday, the 22nd, at noon, producing for the independent theater, or as I like uh, how um, uh, they, they uh, said it, off-Broadway is not off-Broadway, it's independent theater, right? It's that it's individuals doing what they have a passion for. And so, um, yes, it's a little, it's a little different uh, path for us here on Practical Show Tech, but it falled under both practical and show interesting interesting thing about that the person doing it is bruce and joan bruce kramer and joan kane and bruce i met about the same time i met mac about mm -hmm. i don't know a couple of millennia ago and uh he was a lighting designer and i sucked him into the audio world and he since has done become a technical director a producer a uh uh, he does lights and sound. He also does costuming. He does w whatever. And so right. his wife, Joan, is a terrific director. And they decided just to start producing these plays off, off Broadway. And they've done, I don't know, 10 a year for five or six years now and uh, taking it to European festivals and amazing description. They basically produced the whole thing themselves. So it'll be an interesting show. Right, and I guess that's the quintessential example of what is happening coming out of this whole COVID, which is to say, look, there's opportunities. You know, we look around at Broadway and go, oh man, that's too big, it's too much. You can't go up, you can't do that. Well, actually you can. And you can you can find great satisfaction. So I'm looking forward to that conversation and their, uh, their presentation as well. So just keep an eye on our website, practicalshowtech.com. We've just updated it this morning with um, uh, the next week's um, presenters. And I think you're gonna find it really, really intriguing uh, what we're gonna be chatting about. So thanks again, Steve. Uh, appreciate all of this information. And uh, you know, we'll look forward to continued conversations. Fantastic, guys. Thank you uh, for all having right. me. And uh, really, really enjoyed it. And thank you all for attending. And uh, any questions, feel free to shout them out or reach out uh, and we'll find the answers. There you go. And All right. just everybody knows this is recorded. I know I've said that before, but we actually did it this time. Did you edit and out the, the bathroom break though? No, there we you got, go. no, no, we put that in. And uh, all of these questions with all the answers to the quiz, which you'll need at, uh, for the final are gonna be listed with the video. And remember, you can leave two of them blank and still get them right. But there we're you not go. Which which two? <laughs> ah, I right, remember. 
Everybody okay. go have a late lunch and we'll uh, see you for an early dinner. Sounds cool. good. Thanks, guys. All right. Yep. Bye bye. Thank go you, on. Steve. All right. Thank you. Bye.